your trades, love your businesses, your cooperatives, and your business studies. Be full of hope and blessings for your job. Because if you love it, even if it's not as it should be, you are already changing it. The economy changes by doing it and by studying it, but first, by loving it. Francesco's new economy will certainly arise also from your indignation and your dissatisfaction. But above all, it will arise from your love. From your ability to transform indignation in the face of a wrongful world into a shared commitment for a better world. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Assisi. Welcome back, guys. Welcome to the economy of Francesco. We welcome you to the second day of the economy of Francesco with these words from the scientific committee of the event. Some members are here with us in Assisi, including the coordinator, Professor Luigino Bruni. We'll hear from them tomorrow. Guys, today's is very intense, so we must be very good at timekeeping. We also take this opportunity to thank the event technical partner, Clyden, all the technicians, the volunteer, and the center of the Focolare movement for the support to broadcast the events, for the streaming, and the translations. Thank you for this wonderful work. A few months ago, the Organizing Committee of Economy of Francesco received a letter from Giovanni Barzago, an inmate at a prison in Milan. Giovanni asked to be able to present his project and make an appeal during the Economy of Francesco event, to be able to present also this on behalf of the other prisoners. We had prepared a link from the prison for him to tell us about the project directly but the COVID emergency has made it impossible. But we want to read his message. The project stems from my experience in this prison. Once they have served their sentence, prisoners often find themselves without anywhere to stay, and above all, without a job that enables them to live honestly. The heart of the project includes two measures. One is of a political nature and one of an economic nature. For the normative part, we ask the event to put pressure on the Italian legislature to pass a law that facilitates entry into the world of work. A law that provides the obligation to hire a prisoner near the end of their sentence or who ends their sentence in an alternative way. It would also be necessary for the summit to promote a request to the ministries concerned to offer more professional training with qualified teachers. For the financial part, the economy of Francesco is asked to support the establishment of a procedure along the lines of what the Ambrosiano Fund of the Curia of Milan used to do, allocating part of their profits to help meet the immediate needs of an inmate once released. Companies should be able to hire trustworthy prisoners and former prisoners and obtain tax discounts. These jobs should not be limited to things like tomato harvesting, but start from there to move on, for example, to jobs such as the tertiary sector. I hope that the forum can find the time to develop this simple idea of mine, transforming it into a concrete project that can allow people who have made mistakes to have a second chance, and therefore an opportunity to make their contribution to the development of society. In compliance with the laws uh, and civil coexistence, but above all, for the good of everyone, I take this opportunity also on behalf of all prisoners to thank the organizers for their receptiveness.
Thank you for your proposal. The issue of free integration, of free integrating prisoners into the workplace once their sentence has been served, is broad and a global issue. Project LIA is a social enterprise based in Indianapolis in the United States. Thanks to Joan Mandel and Elizabeth Wallen for telling us about this project. Only 4% of the world's female population lives in the US, but the US accounts for over 30% of the world's incarcerated women. Upon release, women must obtain stable employment, locate safe and drug-free housing, and comply with many probation or parole conditions and fees, all while trying to reunite with their families. Employment is the number one indicator towards the return to incarceration. However, nearly 60% of women report not having full-time work in the month prior to arrest. Project LIA provides meaningful employment opportunities to formerly incarcerated women through an innovative and collaborative work environment teaching them how to transform reclaimed materials into beautiful home furnishings and decor. When the women arrive at Project LIA, they carry with them the impact of incarceration, the impact of a criminal justice system that even after serving their time, imprisons those marginalized by race, class, and gender. By giving materials a second chance to become something different, something unique, something more, we are giving the women an opportunity to rediscover their own value, improve their social skills, and find the support and network they need to become self-sufficient and valued members of society. Named after Leah Burnett, a woman who dedicated her life to building bridges between people of different races, cultures, religions, and social backgrounds, Project Leah strives to continue a narrative of inclusive dialogue and economic justice for formerly incarcerated women. Jenna, how was it yesterday? Yesterday was really amazing. Actually, I was chatting the whole time on YouTube, and really it's become a space for sharing ideas and impressions about how they felt about the program yesterday. And you can also feel so much hope and joy from the youth. And so I, we really want to let you know that we feel you here with us. Anyway, one of the things that are interesting is that, did you guys know we have almost 45,000 viewers from yesterday? Wow. It's really amazing. Wow. Oh my Pretty god, bold. that's great. <laughs> so, what are the issues we will address today? You may be wondering, and also us. We will hear about them. Jenna, ah, do you sorry. know something about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, after yesterday, it was so full of interesting topics and ideas. Today, we have three more. A collective reading of Fratelli Tutti, Hints from the Women for Economy Village with Raffaella Petrini. So show socio-ecological responsibility, global view, territorial actions with Leonardo Boff and v Father Wilson Gro. And for those who stay on this channel, we have Generativity, Relational Goods and Civil Economy with Mauro Magatti, Consuelo Corradi and Leonardo Becchetti. So good work to everyone. We'll meet here on time a few minutes before 3 p.m. for a session with the Nobel Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus, economist and social entrepreneur. So without further ado, let's connect with Dalila. Are you there? Hey, hey. Dalila. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay, great. Hi. Could you introduce us to your session speakers? Okay. The last la session. Sarà in uh, italiano. The session is going to be in Italian. Ok. Um, beh, benvenuti allora a questa seconda giornata. Ecco qui ad Economia So welcome Francesco. to the second day. This, in this session, we'll speak about generativity. Io sono Dalila dal villaggio su stili di vita 
e, ed education e saluto appunto i miei compagni di villaggio e I greet all the people from my village today generativity means activating, being active, to activate processes, relations, which is what we've done here at the Economy of Francesco. Activate ourselves as people, as men and women, as citizens. Activate ourselves as entrepreneurs in our territories. It's an interdisciplinary question. And we have relators, teacher from the Sacred Heart University in Milan, who's going to talk about generativity. Then we've got Consuelo Gorhardi, who teaches sociology at Lums in Rome. And she'll speak about the women's perspective on generativity and relational goods. And then we'll have Leonardo Becchetti, teaches at Tor Vergate in Rome. We've been trying to make this concept, more, explain more this concept, open it out to policies in the final panel. There will be some of the people here, the young people who are taking part in the economy of Francis. Chiara took place in the, took part in the discussion on exploitation of agricultural workers. Chiara is connected from Castle Gandolfo. So we greet everybody there. Simone, he's taking part in the village of happiness and politics, talking about relational goods and happiness. And in the field of social cooperation. So it's quite a, a rich session. I won't take any more of your time. And I'll go straight away to Professor Magatti, and he's going to give his talk. So good afternoon to everybody. Greetings to everybody, all the young people who are linked up. Thank you for the invitation. I'd like to talk about generative economy. It's a model which uh, gives the meaning to our future. The, mo the economic model which we've built in the last centuries is all about production and consumption. First of all, we became very expert in the West and then in the rest of the world in production, pro producing material goods. We became excellent in production. And then because we became so good at pro production, we then became educated progressively to become consumers. The result is that we've created an economic system which is all based on quantity and which creates well-being, well-being, material well-being. But at the same time, it interferes with the environment. It produces this inequality, makes personal relationships difficult. And we realize that we have to make a step further. Help looking towards our hearts. And we have to make some effort to do this. Production and consumption are old concepts. This human society is linked to the ability to produce, which comes from the innate technical abilities of mankind. You could say the same thing about consumption. To be human, and being human means consumption right from the beginning of time. 
in order to touch reality, to be nourished in, in this material and cultural sense, and to be others, to be with others. So production and consumption, these two important forms of action, tend to become absolute and fill our days and give meaning to our lives. Generating an anthropo anthropological concept, which we know already, we don't need to study it, especially women will hear from Professor Corradi. Even men, as well as, as well as women, are familiar with generativity. We have to learn the way to go beyond this circuit of production and consumption because we need a deep anthropological dimension to go beyond this model. This anthropological movement of generativity begins with an entrepreneurial motion, a way of transforming an idea, an inspiration into something which takes shape, a concrete shape, something real. Then it moves on and develops into a, a, an organizational di dynamic in taking care of what we have produced, what we've put into the world. And this is important to look at reality as it is, its challenges, a reality which is different from our ideas sometimes to organize helps us to understand who we really are, what our limits are, and then learning to exist with others, to understand our relationship with reality. So the third step of this generative action is promoting, which we call allowing to go knowing that life goes on beyond us. We cannot control life on reality, on being. We can't keep for ourselves what we have brought to life and what we've already received. So in this way, what we have created has to go on. One of the problems of economy, which is based on production is and Consume, consumption is, a, is an obsession with, with control. So generating and is not only, but even they begin from a biological sense, but also in a sociological sense, it says that, that the final aim of every practical action, also in the economics, has to be circulation of life, circulation of freedom through and beyond what we do. Something continues after. I'm always struck by thinking that this is the, the deep meaning of the book of Genesis, where the creative act of God, the creator, after he created the earth, the sky, everything which had no life, the highest act of creation was to put a free creature into the world, the human being, who in relationship with reality takes responsibility. So the first real creative act was a generative act. Our freedom what we can do in the world, our abilities, has a meaning if taking the initiative, doing things, building well together with others, giving full expression to our capabilities, our talents, if we behave like this, we free up others, putting them in the condition of beginning again in their way, this circle of life. This is important because a generative thought is also aspirational. It's a spiral one. It's not a linear 
motion, where, which increases and increases. It's something which is in the form of a spiral, which begins and goes around and round, generates continuously. Only, only like this, if our action is aimed at freeing up others, that's the only way it can acquire beauty. Managing to not man try to dominate. This has been the problem which we have between production and consumption. It's closed. In this way, in increasing plurality and the creativity of human beings in a practical economic way, puts others in the condition of beginning a process. And this is believing in the great abilities of humankind. So to think of a generative economy means working to create the conditions, the social conditions and institutional conditions, so that this anthropological movement of generating may be recognized and reinforced. We can think that after we became producers, after we became consumers, perhaps we can give back creative energy into our economy if we begin to think of ourselves as generators and building an economic system which is based on generativity. And so, to conclude, I would say this means working on four transitions. A formative transition. We have to take care of people if we don't help them to grow, to trust in their abilities, if we don't empower them. The, an organizational transition. We need organizations which are ability to recognize the intuition and ideas of those who belong, which don't constrain these abilities. And then a communitarian transition, which in language of the church is subsidiarity. We need open, plural communities, which try to search out future ways. And then we have the environmental transition, because there is a link between generations and all are created. So from this point of view, the idea of a, a generative economy reopens a future which seemed closed. Grazie, Professor Magatti. Eh, parole ricche di significato, ecco, mettere al mondo, prendersi cura, lasciare andare. Parole importanti. Io passerei la parola alla professoressa. So now I would like to thank you for your words and I'd like to hand over now to uh, Professor. Professoressa, non la sentiamo. So we can't hear you. Adesso mi sentite? Can you hear me now? Sì. So I would like to greet all the young people uh, very warmly. I would like to look at uh, this term of the generativity and the civil economy from the point of view of women. Because there, the feminine point of view exists in this field. This is a question. And I wouldn't like to take this question for granted. I would like to ask for your opinion and your experience. When we ask for greater inclusion of women in contemporary society, more work, greater responsibility, a better salary, the same as that of men, on the basis of what are we promoting this request? This is a question which uh, I think is a radical question, a question which calls into cause aspects of human life on this planet, which are not only exclusive to women, but regard men and all living things on the planet. I think there are two possible answers to this question. The first is the most common, which is that the women 
make up about half of the population on Earth. They are fully people. They have the same rights as men, and these rights must be exercised. They cannot just remain nice words. In Italy, but not just in Italy, we feel, uh, we say there's not yet, uh, there hasn't been a woman prime minister, or there hasn't been a woman president of the Republic, the Italian Republic. What I call the model of not yet, not yet, in the measure of evaluating uh, the success of women. This is the underlying question that we ask and we mean and we go, uh, we look at those places that only men occupy today. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. To uh, occupy a place, a position, means to take on responsibility. But this has to be looked on as an instrument, not as an end in itself. The second possible answer, which is more complex, more slippery, is an answer that contains a lot of in intuitions. It's been criticized by many women in the last century, but it's an answer which is more interesting because it depends less on the fascination of power. The answer is yes, something special exists. There is something in women's experience in the world. Just think at the first word of our seminar that Maro Magatti used, gener generativity. I would like to use this word, to look at this word, in its first primary meaning, the literal meaning. What con contribution do women give literally to generation, to generativity? Development of, uh, of, um, of fertilization change at a very rapid pace. In the last decades, we have uh, heard many novelties. Not all of them have been accepted. But despite all this, despite everything that biotechnology offers us, we still need the body of a woman for a person to be born. There is something specific to women. So uh, to all the technologies, the experts know the feminine uh, spe specific very well. And they translate it into market values, into uh, feminine bi bioethics, which has a greater capital value than male. So for example, just think of the value of the uh, of the market value of a womb that can be rented, so to speak, and everything that uh, is around this concept, even smaller aspects which are outside technology, but which produce an industry, and I would say a specifically feminine industry. The maternal aspect is sold on the market. The hair, women's hair is sold, which has an elevated uh, value. Then there are the influxes of uh, the market, which go in a direction which is almost one way, from the poor countries to the rich countries. So it's not amazing that biotechnical indus industries uh, take advantage of these feminine qualities, while we have forgotten or we pretend not to recognize feminine uh, specific. We don't recognize it. I've only got a few minutes that uh, at my disposition this afternoon. I would like to make three suggestions according to what I think could be considered to be the feminine specific. The first is women have, women are familiar with reality as it actually is. They have a capacity to accept ambiguity, uh, contradictions, imperfection, without losing their uh, uh, sympathy, sympathy. The second, women have a strong affinity with life because they know at a higher level than men 
the story of human flesh, of the material aspect of human life, the uh, fatigue, the work, the labor that is around the material aspect of human life. It's not by chance. Women are mothers, nurses, teachers, social assistants. These are especially feminine professions. And I think there's a reason for this. The third suggestion is that women like to take care of others. This is not about capacity of responsibility, which exists, but it's about liking this, about that feeling of joy that comes in very various places, in the family, in business places, in work, even in scientific laboratories. It has been shown, studies on women scientists have shown within laboratories, women are those who form the next generation of young researchers. So these are not uh, exclusively feminine, but when men, uh, when, the, when these can be recognized as very good uh, feminine characteristics. And these three suggestions, along with others, are important for the future of all of us and of the planet, because they contrast extreme individualism of many market economies. If the only expectation of women is to be equal to men, so autonomous, efficient, and extremely determined, the only expectation, if this is the only expectation, I think that we will finish by forgetting the biodiversity and we will leave it to industry, the biodiversity of uh, women's experience. And this would be a loss for everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Very interesting words. To take care is uh, something which women like to do. Uh, which is a feminine characteristic. I agree, and I thank you for this reflection. And I would now hand over to Professor Pichetti. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I'd like to say this is a sublime message. This exploration of generativity, which Mauro Magatti spoke about in economics, we've transformed into a, a new model, new indicators, and best practices. In order to explain what uh, I mean, I'm going to use some slides. First of all, the new model is based on four points. We have to go beyond a reductionist view of human beings. All of these elements, which we are called homo economicus, all these things help us to form teams, to take responsibility. If Cristiano Ronaldo plays on his own, he lose all the matches. So we see there's a new generation of entrepreneurs who look beyond profit and they look at social impact. Value, also we look at value. There are all these dimensions of value. It's measured also with generativity, as we said before. Then political economy from a model which is in two hands, which depend on the market and institutions, which we presuppose to be benevolent. In reality, a true change can only happen if we have four hands market institutions, active citizenship, responsible business. So, in the vision of this new model, first of all, the person looks for meaning, first of all. 
La povertà di senso è un fattore di mortalità. È un there's a, di there's a, a lack of meaning which, is, which could be fatal. Significato nella vita individuale per farla fiorire. So, e, e vorrei andare a due I'd like frasi to look at two fundamental phrases. One is from Antonio Genovese, Genovese, one of the founders of English economics. Genovese recognizes that people look are self-interested, but the more you you must be virtuous if you're not a fool. It's a natural law that you cannot make your own happiness without making that of human beings. And John Stuart Mill says those are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness, on the improvement of mankind, on the art of, or pursuit, followed not as a means, but as an end. So the happiness is the indirect consequence of a well-spent life, as Mauro Magatti spoke about the desire to to bring to life della soddisfazione di vita ci dicono che è la componente principale che spiega la soddisfazione you see these four verbs the desire to give birth to accompany to let go it's very important to compare this with an aristotelian act it's act rather than power generativity is to do with action rather than power you can have income education health but if you are inactive, you're not happy. Generativity has to do with commitment. We've translated all of this into indicators because this has to be more than philosophy. And so we've tried to measure generativity in the Italian provinces. So we've looked at startups, uh, patents, number of donors, cooperatives, generativity in a democratic demographic sense. So we've looked at generativity of the generations, generativity of older people. Generativity of teenagers. All of these indicators are measurable and they are beginning to be a, a measure for regional and national politics. This is an example, an example of generativity in civil society. We, we launched an idea of voting with your wallet, making pressure on business, business uh, to behave properly, and we can, we can change things from the base. The biggest fund in the world is now saying that we must make ethical investments. We have to choose our investments on their basis of sustainability. And one thing, this is the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, the ICCR, which brings together a lot of ethical finance it has 100 billion managed assets, and it's encouraging people to vote with their wallets. You can see this young person in front of the, the bull in Wall Street. Another example of generativity is what we've tried to do here in our country, the idea is that generativity and happiness tries to put together people with generative intentions. And we have several organizations here in unions, entrepreneurial organizations, NGOs, who have put them together to look after the generativity and social responsibility. We wrote a questionnaire and we opened up a process 
with uh, 500 businesses, which you can see here, which accepted to evaluate themselves on the basis of their social responsibility. Um, so we, the stakeholders of these businesses followed were followed by those who were most involved. From this experience, we wanted to uh, support the best examples of this. And we wanted to become partners of the best experiences of social responsibility, which went from agricultural businesses to those who work in the south of Italy to promote uh, legality to products of sustainability and, and we've also looked at the e e economics of prisons as we heard at the beginning of the transition of the transmission in particular women's prisons so we've seen you know made in the prison is a, is a label now which is emerging we know that 70 percent of women who work in prison there's an enormous uh, fall in the in the rate of reoffending when they when they come out so th this the question of generativity is the message of the civil economy. The world will be changed if we act all together. Our, our vote with our wallets, our promotion through social media of these ideas will build a better world. We have to, right from the moment when we buy a product, we are, we are voting. And so we can help the type of, of economy to to win which promotes social responsibility and protects the environment okay thank you very much for um for being with us and this uh, topic of generativity from a point of view of um, feminine point of view. I, I would also like to talk about it from the point of view of young people. And looking at the person of St. Francis, who, uh, so we're talking about young economists and young entrepreneurs. And I would like to talk about um, the economy of Francis in this sense. The first is the invitation uh, which brought us here and um, the uh, so then St. Francis and uh, met uh, in the leper in St. Damien's and so we're talking about the territory, we're talking about uh, we could see yesterday we're talking not only about being an, a, a help, but being a presence, as we have said before, which means starting from a gesture of gratuity. And so yesterday we could see that this was very important in Francis' life. And then we saw that Francis was a person who was able to reach everybody, speak to everybody. He embraced the leper, he reached the sultan and the pope. And I think that as an economist and as an entrepreneur, we have to be um, spokespeople. We have to be bridges between these two parts of society and bring them to meet. Those who are discarded and the institutions. From the point of view of many projects, we know that uh, we talked about them in our villages. There are many which are being developed in the various regions. And these enable us to take steps towards those who are in need. On one hand, at the level of business, and to uh, create new initiatives for those who need. And on the other hand, social and economic analysis, which allows us as economists to uh, understand which direction to take. 
and in order to be young people who are able to renew institutions from within. And the economy of Francis can be a project which can bring these two aspects together and uh, work on different levels of uh, institutions, business, politics. And with regard to politics, perhaps that's a little bit more delicate. Uh, because on the other hand, uh, you, you, there needs to be uh, an acceptance and uh, to be able to go ahead on your initiative, on your journey. And then there are the crises that we are, uh, we are reflecting on. There are some projects uh, that we have heard about uh, from Professor Bocchetti, for example, in Italy at the Italian Parliament. We have seen that the uh, economic politics have had an impact and we have indices of social well-being which uh, little by little bring us to a culture of evaluating politics with regard to their impact uh, at social level. And we have looked at this in the economy over this time of preparation in the villages also the family, but I think it's too little. And we need to have a political vision which puts the principles of which we're talking at the centre, the principles of the economy of Francis. I think it's too little. We need to give space to the young people in order to let them be, uh, to generate initiatives. And as Professor Magatti said, we need to um, we need to, need to let the young people go. Sometimes we come up against the fact that there are few among all the thousands of young people who are ready and able and have the courageous to go and to be allowed to go ahead, and not just occupying space, but really in order to build something together and something new. So thank you, thank you very much, thank you, Cara, thank you, Simone. Okay. I'd like to concentrate on the cooperative movement, which Professor Becchetti spoke about. They are oriented towards the common good, and they contribute to a real civil economy. What I'd like to do is to speak about some best practices which could be useful for the, all the community of people who are here. Cooperatives, community cooperatives, where the idea is to regenerate and to bring out values which are not present. This kind of business allows communities to behave in a way which, is, which can be appreciated. In Italy, we're looking for a law to favor these type of cooperatives. Then I would speak about social cooperatives of, of type B. They are finalized for people who are marginalized. So they are in favor of marginalized, fragile people. And the third kind, uh, a buyout on the part of the workers uh, of businesses which are in crisis. The workers of the company putting themselves together as a cooperative, they become the proprietor of the business. In Italy, there are ways of doing this. And in a, a moment like we are in this crisis of the moment, they would be very use, useful instruments. The last thing I'd like to say is uh, to favor involvement in the third sector, to have instruments where we can respond more and better to realize real subsidiarity so that the, the 
All the players have the same dignity. So, it's referring to a, a law which favors these new kinds of organization. I'd like to conclude by saying that there are signals, there are best practices, but on the other hand, we observe increasing inequalities in society, the, the question of women, question of empowerment of youth, those are big questions. The biggest challenge for young people is to take the, the step that's missing for a real social economy. So, thank you. Bene, allora, grazie a tutti e sul, insomma, la discussione. So, thank you very much. The discussion has been very dynamic. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for a second round uh, to uh, go deeper into some of the topics, but I think in general, the comments on the streaming have shown great appreciation for all the input and especially the uh, aspect of the feminine participation and uh, the youth participation, as Chiara mentioned. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have a chance to go, to go into these more in some of the workshops. So thank you all very much for this uh, discussion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all and thank, thank you. you all the speakers. We are expecting the talk with Professor Mohamed Yunus. And now a special experience from Napoli that it's linked to the talk Generativity, Relational Goods and Civil Economy. It's been an extraordinary experience. Many people have dedicated time and energy to this project. For us, it's been a sort of pride because it means promoting around Italy too the benefits of what we're doing and giving a different name to the city of Naples. We didn't have a, a, a musical ambition. Ours was an ambition to enable young people to become better citizens. Do you understand the true value of our project is to be av available to others, just as we teachers have been av available to you for the last 10 years, helping a mutual support. There's no competition. Leave competition aside. Leave it to others. You just have to learn and calmly play your instrument. Stay together. Love one another. Love one another. I don't know what religion you are. I'm a Christian. So one of the things I do through music is to love my neighbor, to be available to my neighbor. What can I do? I'm a musician, so I make myself available as a musician. What can I do? If I'm a doctor, I make myself available as a doctor. Paranza started in 2006 in quite a spontaneous way from a group of young people from the neighborhood. They wanted to save their neighborhood. The first activities were tours around the district, guided tours to the catacomb of San Gaudioso. It was difficult at first. We felt failure every day working in a neighborhood that, that people criticized, spoke badly about. It was difficult to find new strength every time, new motivation to continue. Father Antonio Lofredo was very helpful in this. Father Antonio made sure that each of us never, never lost hope of doing what we wanted to do. In 2008, we took part in a competition of the most important foundations that work in the south of Italy, which is called the Foundation with the South, which was offering funding for the revaluation of an abandoned monument and that could create employment in the surrounding area. We knew that here we had the catacombs of San Gennaro, which were 
semi-abandoned because they were managed directly from Rome, from the Vatican. And we thought we would propose a project so that the catacombs of San Gennaro would become an open door to the neighborhood. Now, thanks to your presence, to the work that's being done with the young people in the neighborhood, this neighborhood is changing shape. From today, you unconsciously are part of this generation of generating work, generating work. You're generating trade and activities outside the catacombs. You're also generating a positive example for the many young people who thought they had no future here, that they had a future elsewhere or doing being involved in corruption. But no, it shows that we, what could have been a dream, a utopia, is tangible. The magic of this place is very simple. It's great satisfaction to know that it goes back to Nineveh, to Babylon. But unlike those places, there are places to visit. Here there's a life that lives on in these sites, and it's still lived by the people. This is what's special about this place, this stratification through time. It's strongly connected to the present day. The added value is the encounter with people, the meeting with us. Each one of us has a story to tell, so that inside this beautiful dream, there was the possibility of building our, each one of our own personal stories, because the La Paranza Cooperative was created to give young people a chance, taking these stones that normally would be thrown aside for more important, imported, important projects, they've turned out to be cornerstones. This means that the welfare is not merely handouts, it's what people help develop, so that everybody can be a cornerstone in a system not based on aid, but enabling people to grow. Today there are 11 members compared to the initial six, and we have 39 workers. a wonderful experience. And now, our friends of Niado with a special song. Gracias, Catalina. So, hi everyone. As Raquel said yesterday, Niado is actually much bigger than just the two of us. Today and tomorrow, more of our artists are gonna perform for you online. Today, there's gonna be Fi and Say joining from, Fen from Kenya with the song. Tomorrow, there's Idan with the viola and Sarah Imade from Lebanon with the piano and her, vo and her voice. And now, we want to share something very special with you. Um, it's an unreleased song, actually. It's part of one of our upcoming projects, and it's called Gather. It's still in the making. It tells the story of a young group of rebels on a mission to regenerate the world. Does it ring a bell? <laughs> Originally, it was inspired. turned gray before my home was flooded I had no right to say but with everything that happened I've noticed was stronger than I knew in the eye of the storm we gathered we find a way to make it through take us apart we come back together we made it so far we're gonna take it in the seaside bay for the ones who keep trying day by day we the people of the world we rise we say i'm gonna make this right i'm gonna i'm gonna hold on to my light better find a way to end this fight the message in the bottle is shining bright hey taken for granted as if it was time we depleted the planet we stripped the land it took us forever to reason our doubts and it took us forever to figure this out now we can't run no more this is coming our way soon there won't be much around for us if you step so you make up your mind and you see what you find because it is not whenever we gather together oh, oh. 
Let's all immediately welcome Professor Mohamed Yunus. Thank you, Professor, for participating in the economy of Francesco. Professor, Welcome, delighted can you to be hear with us? you. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome, Professor. Okay. We are Thank so honored to have you, you among us. Thank you for being here. Let's hand Thank over you. to Claudio Barbieri for the conference entitled Finance and Humanity A Road Towards an Integral Ecology. Claudio, can you hear us? I do. I are do. you ready? Good afternoon. We are. Perfect. Right Have a great session. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this plenary session of our event, together with Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Uh, welcome, Professor. Uh, together. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yunus won the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2006, together with the Grameen Bank, for, I quote, their effort to create economic and social development from below, end quote. He is a founder and inventor of microcredit and the chair of the Yunus Center in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, my name is Claudio, and I will moderate today's discussion together with Augustina, Delfina, and Mateus. So together with the participants of the Village Finance and Humanity, we decided to have dialogue with Professor Yunus and to take the opportunity to present with him the content of the work of the groups of this village during this month. To begin with, we'd also like to have some interaction with the participants from home through some interactive surveys during the session. So if you could now share the first slide, uh, you can see our first uh, question, that is, what words come to mind when you hear the word finance? To give your answer, uh, you just need to connect to the website uh, www.menti.com and uh, input the code that you see uh, on the, on, uh, at the top of the slide. So in the meantime, let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Yunus the question. So, Professor, what words come to your mind when you think about finance? Well, the finance uh, actually started with the linking the real sector so that it facilitates the interchange of the thing. But gradually it became something in a very wrong, it went very wrong direction. It went uh, only to uh, make people more and more rich. Uh, that's how uh, the whole system worked. So it became a tool, it became a vehicle for wealth concentration. So that's how I'll stop. Thank you very much. In the meantime, we, we can comment on the evolving word cloud. We see that uh, words such as uh, investment, money, power, and speculation come out. So, as you were saying, uh, uh, possibly also something negative is linked to the, uh, to the economy. We had some difficulties along the way. Um, what do you think about the answers we are receiving? We see that money, power, and investment are central to this word cloud. You're asking me or you're asking the audience? I'm asking, I'm asking you. Sorry, Professor. OK, OK. I'm going to put that. Yeah, uh, for me, it's, it's a uh, corona pandemic. Uh, it was a good occasion to uh, uh, see what is happening to the world because it, it revealed all the weaknesses, all the ugliness of the pre existing system. One of the things, to make uh, my response short, one of the things it really revealed globally 
the people who were at the margin of existence, those who were daily income earners, who were uh, earning uh, by their own efforts, hanging on to their life, uh, livelihoods which can only support themselves, suddenly, uh, globally, they fell from their uh, hanging at the margin. Uh, they became poor, they don't have any food, they don't have any income, they don't have any livelihood. And that's almost half the population of the entire world. In a matter of weeks, this happened. So this is what it, it does, because uh, the system is built in a way uh, where finance is facilitating all the world go in one direction, going to the top. Today, we have built a world where 1% of the population of the world owning 99% of the wealth of the world. So finance is responsible for that, the way we have designed it, and the concepts which is pushing that finance in that direction are responsible for it. Because the only thing we know in our business, in our financial world, in our business world, is a maximization of profit. That's the only religion we have, maximization of profit, that's the only goal. And that maximization cannot do not consider anything else. It doesn't look for the world, it doesn't look for the benefit of other people, it doesn't look for whether it's safe for the planet or not. It's the only thing you do, you have to maximize profit. So you grab everything. Uh, even, even when the corona vaccine is coming up, you see the same thing in a very ugly situation. The companies are just competing with each other uh, to have a festival of super profit. Uh, they don't care whether these vaccines will be available to millions and billions of people around the world, how to make sure everybody can get it, everybody can get it at the same time, rather than wait for a year, month and years. Uh, even if it happens, they are, they are making it so that only the rich countries can afford to buy it. And the rich countries are also buying it in a big number. Uh, some countries are buying three times, more times, as many dosages as they will actually need for their country where the poor countries still have no access to that vaccine. So this is, again, a playground of super profit. Again, we see when the death is from confronting you, when you are seeing people are dying of a disease, uh, you, don't, you don't make any, any uh, uh, concession that, OK, for this time being, I will not concentrate on the profit. I'll concentrate in saving lives. That's not the day. You want to make a um, huge amount of money. We are told the founder, the stub, people who are behind the big companies, already made super, super profit and, uh, uh, by the stock market in, uh, price increase uh, through their vaccines. So you see what happens when you let it go, with the system uh, in the wrong direction. Unfortunately, we do, yes. And in fact, one of our group worked on the opportunity, opportunities and the threats of finance nowadays. So I think you, you clearly specified some of the main threats we face nowadays. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, share uh, some opportunities that the group has been analyzing. And uh, as you said, to try go beyond the profit maximization and uh, the idea of return to investment, what we try to do is to focus on the methodologies of uh, via pulcritudinis, which is the way of beauty that we can find in the Catholic social doctrine. Uh, it's divided in three phases. So first, uh, you ask what you can see, what strikes you. You, you judge it, whether it's good or evil, and uh, then you act. And uh, the group uh, analyzed the three case studies. So for instance, they interviewed uh, managers from Forteza in Panama, which is a crowdfunding company. They interviewed managers from AQIF in the United States, uh, which is uh, a financial company specialized in financing the fintech sector in uh, underserved developing and emerging countries. And finally, uh, there is a, a case study about up, Uplift Mutual in India, which is a micro insurance company. So it's similar to microcredit, uh, but in the sector of insurance. And their CEO, Shailab Kumar, said, uh, I quote, if you build for purpose, profit will follow. If you have profit without purpose, you'll never be happy, end quote. Professor, what could, it, what could we add to this uh, 
to this sentence? Well, uh, I was saying that the main uh, culprit in the whole economic system, the capitalist system that we built, uh, is the profit maximization. Uh, so this is what uh, remains as a sole uh, direction and the sole power uh, which guides human being, make human being uh, profit-centric, profit maximization-centric, uh, cannot see anything else. This is based on a very simple idea that the economists have adopted right from the beginning. The interpreted human being as someone who is driven by self-interest. So that's the, that's the meaning of a human being for a, a capitalist system. Uh, so they are driven by self-interest. And that self-interest ca came into the structure of business where you translate it as profit maximization. So you, as a, you develop your, you maximize your uh, profit. Uh, that's your self-interest. And in the process, you ignore everything else. It's a, it's a uh, one-eyed kind of journey that you see only one thing, you don't see anything else. So that is what is a, at the, uh, uh, created all the problem. We are saying that interpretation of human being is done in a wrong way. Human beings are not uh, driven by self-interest alone. Self-interest, element of self-interest, yes, of course, we have them for self-preservations and so on. But the bigger part of human being is driven by common interest, interest which is common to all, uh, to solve people's problem, common problem. And that's the kind of thing that we have. So it's a combination of self-interest and collective interest. These are the two interests. But the economists for absolutely eliminated the whole part of collective interest only they kept the self-interest. That's why we created all those problems. Even if you talk about microcredit or microinsurance, I'm not talking about what you have quoted. In general, I'm just talking about when you say uh, microcredit, microcredit is, it itself is not a uh, clean word. Uh, it only a clean word if somebody is not using microcredit to maximize profit for himself. If they are using bank credit for uh, uh, maximizing profit, they are not doing any good to people. They are, they are in the same class as a loan shark. A loan shark want to make money, and that's what we complain about it. We complain that the formal financial system is not coming. Now the formal financial system comes, but in the form of uh, uh, micro credit for maximizing profit. Then it's in the wrong path too. So when we created micro credit, we created micro credit as a social business. You see, that's a departure. Social business comes for collective interest, not self-interest. So we created a business called social business, which is designed not for making money for yourself, but solving people for others, other people's problem with zero personal interest. So in the one side, maximization of profit. On the other side, is zero personal profit. That's a social business. When microcredit becomes a social business, then it becomes a wonderful thing. So you're doing it not to make money for yourself. You're doing it to solve people's problem. They need financial system, financial resources. You provide financial resources. You cover your cost. It's not a free, it's not a charity, but it's a business, but a business where the intention of making money is not there at all. It's a zero personal interest. And if you do the micro insurance or anything, uh, for the poor people, uh, so you can do it two ways, either to maximize profit or you uh, do it for uh, social business at zero personal profit. So these are the two clear ways uh, that you have to distinguish. Well, just one word will not uh, give you the whole picture. You have to see what kind of business is that. Is it social business or it is a, a profit maximizing business? Thank you. And uh, I just want to uh, go back for a second on uh, the consequences on real economy. We have, in fact, uh, a group who worked on that. And I will now ask uh, Agustina if you could give us an introduction and a brief uh, summary of what you did. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, if I may, I would like to quote Dr. Yunus, who some yeah. years ago in a, in a book, he said, that dreams are made out of impossibles. And for me, this, uh, this, is, this idea describes what the economy of Francesco family has done during this challenging year. Um, we tried to turn some of those impossibles into possibles, uh, thinking of concrete proposals to put financial instruments 
at the service of resolving some urgent social and environmental issues. And during these months, we, we try to work on this uh, relation between financial system and real economy with an incredible group of young uh, change makers and scholars. And we studied how actually the financial system suffered this perverse disconnection with the real economy and with that, with human lives and with our common home. We analyzed uh, these facts. We tried to study these, these elements and the incentives, and we understood how indeed finance can lead to ethical, responsible, and impactful results. So we identified that there are needed more channels and platforms, more networks that link resources and talents that already exist, because it's not a matter of scarcity, uh, to link those, those elements with uh, initiatives that serve the common good. As well, we identified that it is needed uh, an intensive and huge work on cultural transformation to open our minds towards a more ethical finance and to link this with ethical consumption and production. These are not easy tasks, but we know we have a lot to contribute to this mission. And for us, this, this event and this moment is just the beginning. So thank you, Agustina. I think we can share now a second question with our participants from home. And uh, it is about sustainable finance. So what do you think is the key driver for future sustainable finance? Some of you already started uh, answering these questions. Uh, while we wait for more answers, uh, let's start again with uh, Professor Yunus. So, Professor, um, we talked about uh, the difference between profit maximization and uh, a, a more of a social uh, vocation of business. But more in detail, can I ask you, uh, what do you think sustainable finance means and what are the key drivers? toward a future sustainable finance? Uh, sustainable finance to me uh, doesn't lead me anywhere. Uh, I would say there are two other things uh, rather than sustainable finance. I would say, is it a harmful sustainable finance or it is uh, beneficial sustainable finance? Being sustainable doesn't tell me the full story. It could be harmful and sustainable. Uh, like the present uh, financial system. It's harmful, but sustainable. You make money, you cover your costs, and so on. It's sustainable. It will continue. It will not... Uh, it, it, given the consideration of the company itself. But is it sustainable globally? Uh, how uh, uh, the uh, entire globally you benefit from it? So I would say, in order to emphasize that part, I would say, is it uh, harmful, uh, sustainable? It's harmful because present economic system uh, it leads to economic uh, uh, wealth concentration that I mentioned before. It leads to three different things that I let me quickly add because this is the core of the discussion. Uh, the system that we built is sustainable in a very narrow sense, but in a global sense, it's not only sustainable, it's dangerous. Absolutely, it's a killing. Today, human beings, uh, I, I will put it this way, human beings are most... Uh, endangered species on this planet. Uh, the, we are about to go. We are about to finish ourselves. And that's what our uh, people, our scientists telling us, uh, global warming is going in such a direction, in such a speed, uh, that very soon uh, we will not be existing in this planet. Even our children, teenagers, are marching on the street. I'm sure it's, they are marching in the street in, in your town too. Uh, this, uh, they call themselves Fridays for Future. Uh, they are accusing, these teenagers are accusing their parents, telling them that you are totally responsible. You created a world where we have no future. You have stolen our future. That's the word they use. They have, you have stolen our future. So teenagers accusing uh, parents that they have stolen, uh, their parents have stolen their future. Why? Because we created a system sustainable in a, in a narrow sense, in a business sense, each company is sustainable to cover the cost and so on, but at the sacrifice of the whole world, whole generation of human beings, human being will become extinct. So we are only in the countdown stage right now. We are moving in a way, very soon will be over. So 
This is caused by the present economic system that we built. Uh, if you continue that path, uh, this is the result we'll get. We are not here for a long time. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a suicide, suicidal path. And again, pandemic has come and everybody is trying to push the economy back again to the pre-pandemic situation. That's what they call pre-pandemic situation. And I'm telling everybody, why do you want to go to pre-pandemic situation? That was terrible. That world is absolutely uh, pushing us into our uh, ultimate death, ultimate disaster, because global warming will push us that way. So now that corona uh, pandemic has stopped that machine, uh, it's not taking us, the train which is carrying us to our death has stopped. Uh, the machine has stopped. So I said, this is a good opportunity. We can get out of the train and look around and ask ourselves, should we get back to the train and go to the ultimate uh, disaster? Or this is a good occasion we have. We move in a separate, another direction, opposite direction, to find a way, world which is, sustain, which is uh, something that we can build which will be zero net carbon emission, there'll be no global warming, there'll be no wealth concentration, there'll be no unemployment, those kind of things. And we can continue to pursue that. So this is the time to do that. So sustainability, if you just look at sustainability in the sense of a business uh, format, then uh, you don't get the answer. You see in a global format, what is happening? What is our report card? What, do we, what does that sustainability brings us to? Uh, unless we are safe in this planet, unless we have a sh we have an economy which is shared by everybody, unless it's an economy where everybody has something uh, productive to do, that economy is not something I would call uh, sustainable. So all these businesses contributing, which are profit maximizing businesses, are contributing to this. The result, net result, is a total disaster. Thank you. So sustainable, but it depends on which sense we give uh, to the world. Yeah. And I see that from home, uh, many people identified education as a key driver for a future uh, redirection of finance. So we will have more to say about it uh, in a, a short time. But first, let me uh, give the floor to Delfina to know what did the group uh, uh, of sustainable and finance of our total disaster. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Delfina. Okay. Um, Hello. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm having a little bit of a trouble, um, but thanks for, for sharing. Um, and I wanted to share, I come a little bit to, to share um, what we have worked on the sustainable finance group within the finance and humanity village. And one thing that was very clear when we started was that um, there was this common understanding that finance and money were a means rather than an end. And that was very clear for every one of us and was the core of, of all our work. And more specifically, we understood that it was a means to achieve sustainable development, which touches a lot on the real economy, as um, we have already heard. Um, but digging deeper, we see the end of sustainable finance to be the supporting of a community that built, of a, an economy that builds community. And what community? Community of people where nature is an integral part of. So that was what we understood as part of sustainable development and to what sustainable finance ultimately contributing to. Now, um, for this to materialize, because as we understand, while well, we understand that finance is a means to an end, um, in, with time it has to detract a little bit from that. Um, and sometimes we see finance and money as an end in itself. But to materialize this, uh, sustainable finance that supports an economy that builds community, where nature is an integral part of. There are, um, we find the following to be at the essence of sustainable finance. One, that it recognizes the interconnectedness in nature, in human relations, and thus in economic relations, for which we ought to bring forward a system thinking approach to devising the processes needed, the criteria of eligibility, how do we, I mean, the measure, measurement of impact of results, regulation, etc. Two, the sustainable finance recognizes that economic value creation, like value creation in itself, is to refer to the actions that actually nourish this community. 
driving and supporting a long-term vision, integrating, not summing up, but integrating the three aspects, socially, social and environmental aspects, primarily, and then the economic aspect. And third, um, that sustainable finance refers, yet, refers yes to the financing of um, money to specific projects, social enterprises, etc. But it also refers to the institutional framework and institutional arrangements needed for the financial system as a whole to support sustainable development. So a little bit in a nutshell, um, sustainable finance in our conclusion was ultimately finance that sustains the community. Thank you. Thank you, Delfina. And uh, let me go back, uh, uh, Professor Yunus, to something you, you, you mentioned before. You uh, spoke about debt, and uh, it is clear to me that uh, you also share um, this vision according to which, uh, uh, I mean, this vision in general of finance, that there is not something uh, good or evil per se, but rather it can be good or evil depending on what you do with it or depending on the intentions that you have. So concerning that, there is this uh, uh, double uh, face uh, uh, idea, the one that uh, borrowing excessively cannot be good, but also, um, uh, but also abusing, um, and, and abusing power of creditors might also not go in the right uh, direction. And nowadays, we talk a lot about debt. We spoke about it before the financial crisis. Uh, nowadays, with the COVID pandemic, uh, um, the problem of the debt for, um, for countries have, has been uh, raised up again, uh, especially for the public debt of developing and emerging countries. So what is that, according to you, makes the difference between uh, uh, good and evil when we talk about debt? Yeah, uh, you already mentioned that you said uh, it's a, finance is a means to an end. And my question is, what is the end that we are looking for? That has to be defined first. Then we'll see how to use the finance. Uh, if, the de if the end is to create a world which is self-destructive, because we are destroying the world, and finance is helping it, because it's a, it's a finance which is... Uh, creating all those businesses and industries and so on, facilitating them. Uh, so that's not could not be our end. So definitely destroying the planet is not the end. We talk, you talked about uh, finances, uh, which is helpful to the community. Community is a small part of the whole global uh, community, bigger bigger human existence on this planet. Uh, so it's it's not just a community of a small group of people. The whole world is at a danger right now. It's a, this is what the global warming is talked about. And global warming is financed by uh, all the institutions that we have built. And we know exactly who, which is contributing how much to global warming, uh, which uh, uh, companies contributing for which particular aspect of business is contributing how much, fossil fuel is contributing how much, plastic is contributing how much, uh, cattle industry is contributing so how much. We know that exactly. And these are all financed by our financial system. So uh, th th this is not the right end. Uh, that's the point I'm making. That is, you say it's a means to an end. End has to be something uh, desirable. Some end doesn't hold, wherever I'm, we pushed into. That's not the end. End is something predetermined that we want to get that end. When in the same finance, if we want to create a world of zero net carbon emission. Finance can help it, definitely. So that finance will be, then it becomes a really something, the end which is uh, desirable for us, which is good for us. And, and finance has become the tool of the, of the vehicle for wealth concentration, which is again an explosive thing. The whole world will uh, uh, explode uh, in anger, uh, in uh, deprivation because of the uh, wealth concentration. And we know that uh, this is a ticking time bomb, will we'll explode any time. So if, if finance is doing that, then finance is the wrong end. We don't want that finance. We want to reverse finance. We want to do that other way. Like uh, finance doesn't 
good to the bottom 50% of the people. That's why the loan sharks take advantage of the uh, bottom 50% of the people because uh, conventional finance will never go and work with the poor people, poor, uh, rural people or wherever they are. They are victims of the uh, uh, loan sharks. They are victims of mafias, the victim of the um, uh, payday lenders and all kinds of things all over the world. So this is not what uh, we wanted to do. So we need to redesign the whole financial system to reach the end. If we make up our mind to what end we want to go, definitely we can re uh, design the whole system. That's why the microcredit was born. That's why the social business was born because we, we fixed our end and we build the whole system to reach, go to the end, uh, to reach that end. So that is the most important thing in the global scenario. When we say that uh, it, it, we, uh, the, it's a means, uh, finance is a means, uh, it's true, uh, but end has to be elaborated, man. end has to be defined first. You say, no, we, like I said, no going back. No going, we have to decide that this is not what we want with our finance. That should be already established. Like for example, uh, I go and put my money uh, in my bank, whatever bank I have. Uh, I put my salary and whatever savings I have in my bank. But I never ask the bank, where do you put my money into your use? Because after all, the bank will be investing this money to some other industry, some other business proposition, and so on. Uh, that question is very important. I'm giving my money to uh, safekeeping for you, uh, 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 to keep it with you. But you take this money and invest in the fossil fuel industry. So I'm responsible for it. So I want to make sure before I put my money into a bank, I ask the question to the bank. Tell me where have you invested all your money in the past one year or two years or three years? Where did you put your money? I said, no, 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 no. If you do that, if you put the money in this plastic industry or this industry or this industry, definitely I don't want to put my money into your bank. I'm looking for a bank which doesn't do that. See, the game end, what is the end of my money? Because my, my money, it's my decision. So if I do not do that, I just go blindly, they give me uh, a little bit extra interest, I get a little income, or they are pleasant to me, I give it to them, and they merrily go and destroy the world. That's not what we should be. So we have to be our, we are responsible for it because whatever global warming is happening, uh, because we don't want to take responsibility for anything. Uh, and say they were taking care. They are not taking care of it. They are, they are doing just the opposite of what we expect them to do. So we have to be careful at every stage what we want to do. Once then end becomes, to me as an individual, as a citizen, my end has to be very clear. So whatever I do, I have to see that whether uh, the businesses I'm doing, the partnership that I'm doing is also reaching out to that end. That end is most important. Then finance will gradually move into that direction. Otherwise, finance will carry on the wrong direction. And uh, let me ask you then what the role of financial regulation could be. So is there an entity that should be regulating finance? Might that be a central bank, uh, um, a government, uh, an international government? And uh, what would be the appropriate scale of regulation? Do we need uh, uh, country regulation, regulation for unions or federations? Uh, of countries, or do we need a global regulation? Oh, it's up to you what, what you want, again, your end, because <laughs> everything is what, what we want. Whatever we want, it will happen. If you don't want anything, wrong things will happen. For example, if we, for, uh, for regulation for banks, you said, mentioned that. Uh, if you said that I will regulate the bank to make sure they don't only concentrate on few clients, big clients, I want to make sure they distribute their lending procedure to all the way down. If, the, if I make that mind, uh, if I'm the government, I'm the town, I'm the central bank, if I make up this mind that I want to make sure bank under my control, I'm the regulator, bank that I supervise must extend their loans to all levels of the society. Then, of course, I'll go and ask the question, why are you doing that? If you don't do that, I'll close down your business. So the regulation has to have a purpose too. Today, I don't ask that question. I just, I'm happy that, okay, he gives, gives money to the rich people. That's not my business. Why should I interfere with them? 
See, I, I have abandoned that. I have licensed him to give financial services, but he gives his financial services to the uh, only handful of people who are becoming rich and rich and super rich. And all the concentration, the concentration of wealth is facilitated by him. And I, as a regulator, I don't play any role. If the regulator plays a role that no, you cannot do that. So that we have to make sure the regula regulator is only an instrument, is the decision-making body. As the, either the central bank is the decision-making body or the government of the country is the regu uh, uh, controlling uh, the, uh, the regulator, uh, the, the give the rules to the regulator. They have to make sure. Then I make the rule that wh whatever lending you do, you cannot lend money to fossil fuel because it's destroying our uh, future. Our children have no future because of this. So I make sure that uh, uh, banks do not lend any money to the fossil fuel. If they want to run their business, they have to do it on their own, not with my money and your money. Uh, so the government has decided uh, that the regulators will do. So what is that regulators are regulating? That's a real question, not regulators whether good or bad. Regulators have to be uh, given a task what should be that task? That task would be something which is not happening today. That, that we are not saying that bank cannot do this, bank cannot do this, and bank must do this, and bank must do this. We are not having that. We are just simply saying, okay, your accounting is like this. Can, these are little things. We are on big issues. We have just left the door open. There's no regulator for that. So we have to make those decisions, fundamental decisions. Do we let them, let the banks, let the businesses destroy our planet? Or we take control and say, no, we regulate you. We, we can do only if you can create a, a net zero carbon emission world, then you, you can do that, this business. Otherwise, we'll not let you do the business. If you can uh, turn around the wealth concentration instead of wealth going up, wealth going, coming down, meaning that you have to provide services to the poorest person. Uh, and they say, no, we cannot be done. Then you give example that microcredit is doing all over the world. There's no problem there. So we can argue with them. They're now it's just simply they are not interested. In it. If they are interested in it, they'll happen. So the regulator task is to make sure X amount of money, whatever loans you are giving out, 50% of the money should go to the bottom 50% of the people as a lending process. Then things will change because we are not saying that. He can do anything he wants. Then, then what is the regulation for? That's my question. Of course. And uh, I've seen a comment that asks, uh, uh, how could we not ask ourselves uh, what could be the purpose of regulation? Well, uh, let me share you with you the work of the group on uh, the role of financial regulation of our village. And uh, we did ask ourselves the questions. And uh, here is uh, uh, a framework we, we thought about to try establishing an end, uh, to evaluate an end uh, for uh, finance. It is based on the four cardinal virtues. And what we try to do is to uh, allocate different policies and to evaluate uh, the, re the, the idea behind different policies according to prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. We also have uh, uh, different examples and references in the Bible that tells us, uh, that gives us an interpretation of these uh, concepts. And uh, this is the first attempt on, on our side to try to uh, give a purpose to finance. Now, we are entering the final part of our, um, uh, of our uh, meeting together. So let me share you the last, uh, the last question of, uh, of our meeting. Um, how large? Do you think derivatives, derivative finance is uh, with respect to the world uh, GDP? So we see that a lot of people started answering uh, the questions. Many people think that derivative finance is about six times or three times bigger than the world uh, GDP. Uh, Professor Yunus, perhaps you already have the answer. Yeah, this is a, a simple answer. It's a question of if you, this is the way uh, you make money. You speculate, you dump everything in a derivative, you make a package and you sell things. You don't know what you're buying, what you're selling. You make a big publicity that this is going to make lots of money. You 
fuel the engine of the uh, speculation and you make money out of it. You don't know what it is. So this is how uh, the, the capitalist system is running. It's a, they they uh, make a fictional world and pursue that world and say, ah, the economy is growing very fast and so on and so forth. So this is what we have to address. We, that's why we have to come back to the real economy. What is happening? You said the economy is growing, the prosperity is coming. Prosperity for whom? We're not asking that question. That's why I begin my talk by saying that, look, uh, despite what you're doing, all those uh, derivatives and everything, and the six times and 10 times, whatever it is, uh, ultimate result, the report card of the system is uh, you, you have concentrated all the wealth of the world, no matter what that world is, all the world, 99% of the world's wealth is in the hand of 1%. What kind of system is that? Any, any little kid will tell you that's a wrong system. You don't, you don't have to go in a big uh, uh, academic debate about it. We don't need that kind of system. We need a system which, where wealth will be shared. Even if it is a smaller uh, GDP, even if it is smaller uh, wealth, but we all share that. Uh, you make a huge uh, wealth, and 99% goes to somebody, and we have nothing. The 99% of the people have nothing, 1% or less. So that's not the system that uh, anybody could carry on and say, oh, this is a fair system. You talk about justice, this is not justice. So we have to have a uh, basic thing straighten out. Make sure. Look, don't go into complications. It's under, then you get disoriented. What are they saying we don't understand anymore? Just say what is happening to the wealth concentration. They, can, they may debate you whether it's 99% or 98.5%. They cannot say it's a 50-50. That's for sure. That's a, it's an extremely, extremely ugly wealth concentration. And it's getting worse. But the machine, but the machine keeps working. Machine keeps working, so it gets worse and worse. I said, then what happens? What is left? Yeah. What is the expansion? What is this expansion about? What is this G GDP growth about? What is this uh, uh, prosperity about? Whose prosperity are we talking about? Are we talking about the prosperity of one percent or prosperity of the ninety-nine percent? So those questions kind of kept kept hidden. So let's ask that question: Why we cannot share that? It cannot be done. That's where our task began. Why can't it be done? Let's do it. Let's do the reverse thing. That's what we did when we started microcredit. Everybody said it cannot be done. I said, why not? Let's try it out. I mean, we may fail, but we should try. And we tried, and it happened. How did we do it? We just uh, we didn't know anything about banking. We just look at the banking system, how they work, and we reverse everything. We did. Uh, they go one the one way. We do the other way. They go to the rich. We go to the poor. They go to the city. We go to the village. They go to men. We go to women. They ask for collateral. We said no collateral. So everything is reverse. Then it happens, and it happens beautifully everywhere around the world. So this is how. So we have to reverse it. My point is, if you go by the same old road, if you follow the same old road, you'll always end up with the same destination. And that destination is the destination of debt. And very clear. Everybody is saying that that's, it is waiting. It's waiting by the global warming. It's waiting by the wealth concentration. It is waiting uh, by the artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence will remove everybody from their job. And that's a massive unemployment. And it is coming. It's very fast it's coming. And is this the purpose of the economy? Is this why we build the economy? You can make all kinds of explanations what you do. I'm not interested in explanation. I said, definitely we don't really need that result. We need a reverse result. That's why I talk about the three zeros. Zero net carbon emission. We want to create a world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission. There will be there will be no carbon emission at all. Zero net carbon emission. That's a one zero zero wealth concentration. Wealth will not be concentrated. Wealth will be shared by everyone. We can design it. We can do that. It's not an impossible task. Simply, we never paid attention to it, and that's why it happened. And zero unemployment. We don't want the artificial intelligence to take out all the jobs. We will rather have everybody create, be creative, be something, doing something, and entrepreneurial work, and so on and so forth. So this is the three zeros we have to look for. If you set this three zero as the end, then design everything accordingly. See, all, everything is means to that end, but we have not used that means to this end. We use this all this means to some other end, opposite end, global warming, wealth concentration, and massive unemployment. So we have to reverse it. So 
we go by the same road, we add, add, we go to the same destination. Now we have defined a new destination, three zero destination. So we have to build new roads. All these old talk will not give us leaders there. We have to build everything anew, everything separately. Then we can reach that new destination. Otherwise, we are finished. And uh, I will ask now to Mateus, who worked uh, about uh, financial education. Um, his group uh, um, tried to find uh, uh, possible ways of acting in the direction of sharing financial information with uh, uh, different target groups. And uh, Matteo, give us the answer to our uh, survey before. Thank you, Claudio. Hi, Professor Yunus. Hi, everybody. Well, it's an impressive Hi, number. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor. According to the World Bank, in 2019, the world real GDP was $87 trillion. And according to the Bank of International Settlement, the gross market value of derivatives is $15 trillion. But the national outstanding amount of derivatives in 2020 is $600 trillion. So how large is the derivative finance with respect to the world GDP? It's about six times. And we are talking about GDP during our research, as you said, Claudio, in financial education group, focused on SMEs, we realized that according to the World Bank, the formal SMEs contribute 40% of national GDP in emerging countries and represent more than 50% of employment. And we are not talking about the non-formal SMEs. Besides, we have about half of them with employees that will shut down during their fifth year. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, one of the main reasons of this shutdown is the lack of financial management, is the lack of financial education. So yes, we have a lot to do, but we also have a lot to share to help them to survive more time, to have better business. This makes our mission even better than now in the economy of Francesco, Professor Yunus, we have a lot to do. Thank you, Claudio, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Mateus, thank you very much. Thank you to the work, uh, uh, thank you to your group for the work you have done. Uh, so, we are about to conclude our session. We, uh, as uh, the finance, finance and Humanity Village uh, participants, would like to invite all of you who are at home to uh, keep, uh, to, to, think, to take a moment and think about uh, something that you found particularly inspiring, something that you want to remember, uh, perhaps uh, even a commitment you want to take toward uh, a better future uh, economy. As uh, Professor Yunus uh, said, uh, it's not sufficient to see uh, what is uh, uh, the, the injustice and inequalities in the world. We need also criteria to judge uh, what is going on. But perhaps the most important thing is to act. Am I correct, Dr. Yunus? Did I summarize? Yes, absolutely. Your... Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, if we make up our mind, we can get it done. Simply, we have to make us make us make up our mind. That's it. We want this world, and we're going to get it. There's nobody can stop us. Uh, nothing is impossible for a human being. And we can get done anything we want. Simply, we are not paying attention. Today, our house is burning, and the global warming is taking over. Our house is burning. But inside the house, we are having a big party going on. We're enjoying ourselves as if nothing is going on. But we realize, we don't even realize that the house is burning. Very soon, it will not exist. So we, this urgency of it is a very important thing. It's, we don't have much time left. It's only 20 years or 30 years, or that's about it. Otherwise, if, if global warming goes from 1.5 degree to 2 degrees Celsius, you are in trouble and it will finish. And it takes only probably 2050 to get to there. So people are talking about the net zero carbon emission by 2060. Uh, I hope we can make it because if we, today, if we don't change those institutions, we don't uh, uh, change the policies, it will not happen. Simply talking about it will not get it done. But we have to make up our mind 
to make it happen. It's in our hand. It's nothing, it's not something nature gives it that way. It's not nature, it's us. We define, we designed this world in a wrong way. Now we have to get it fixed so that we go the right way. So that we have to build this new road and we can do that. Thank you very much. And uh, one last question, possibly. I have a question from yeah. the backstage. What do you think yeah. about the economy of Francesco? Uh, I don't know the details, so I cannot give a good response, but I will see the lots of similarity of thinking because uh, we, he paid all his attention to the poor people and designed things for doing the, and brought it to the attention of the uh, religion and everybody else. So there's a lot of commonalities about it, but I cannot give you in a specific way how it is done. And that you can figure out. Okay, thank you. So we will. Thank you, thank you. And uh, let me thank you again, uh, Dr. Mohamed Yunus and his team who helped us, Agustina, Delfina, Mateus, the IT team in the backstage, uh, the participants of the village, finance and humanity, organizers and collaborators, and all of you who, who followed us uh, from home. And, who helped, and anyone who had to make in this uh, session possible. Thank you again. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you. Con much. Continuation. And I'll give the line back to Assisi. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you a lot, Professor Yunus. And thank, thank all the you. session speakers for this meaningful time for Economy of Francesco participants. Thank you a lot. We were really happy to have you here. Now, Let's join the group Mosaico from Spain with a beautiful song. Okay. Esperanzas Dividiendo dolores Abrazando el camino Uno del otro Uno del otro
Thank you a lot, Mosaico. And now we have a special gift, a song for, from our friend Valentino. Let's go. Oh, Lord Almighty, let us be united. God of mercy, let us be your artists. Oh, God of mercy, let us fight for justice. Let us be one soul. Don't let the world bring you down. Don't let the world bring you down. Don't let the world bring you down. Don't let it fool you. Don't get fooled by society and its crazy technology. Try and taste the joy of living Gift of responsibility What kind of world you wanna leave Losing track of your basic needs Forgetting rid of possession Might even show you real freedom So let us dance, let us chant To the beauty of creation and solitude but well you know you're not alone in this fight for our mother earth a new economy is the mission to grow and care the land we will come so let's dance let's dance to the beauty of creation let us believe let us hope on this new generation Sigue moviendo de frente, sigue adelante y camina Lleva el amor de tus labios a todas zonas vacías Celebra, crea, conecta como la mejor compañía Es el momento de nuestras vidas Don't let the world bring you down Don't let the world bring you down Don't let the world Thank you, Thank you, Valentino. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for making us dance. Now we will hear and watch together another great experience from a young Andrea. And then we will dive into the Assisi atmosphere. So let's go. Sandra, 
Visconti e sono prima di tutto marito di Francesca, padre di Filippo Riccardo e di Letta. I am Andrea Visconti and I am first of all Francesca's husband and father Filippo Riccardo e di Letta. But I am also a failed digital entrepreneur and a communicator. A couple of years ago, in fact, I had a technological startup that went bankrupt and I felt the need to tell my children that their father's company had gone bankrupt, but that their father was not a failure. To do this, I wrote them a fairy tale that I then turned into a video fairy tale. When I published it online, it went viral and ended up in all newspapers, radio, TV stations like Rai and Mediaset. Today, I use video fairy tales and other content as a form of communication for media, for characters and companies to narrate and transmit values. I also founded the Fail Good Association, which aims to spread the topics of failure in digital education from children and young people, but also for their parents. This is because I love children and young people so much, I really want to be with them as much as possible to maintain their simplicity of heart and the rebellious spirit that they have, that children and adolescents have, while trying to channel them towards good. The project I'm working on is a brand content agency that tells stories and values in the media to make the most interesting companies and projects known to the general public, while integrating this aspect of business with the ethical aspect of the association. I want, in fact, with the agency, with the association to exploit the immense potential of digital and other technology in a positive way in order to be able to explain and show young people but also their parents that in the end technology is a good tool. Vedendo Francesco che il Signore accresceva i suoi fratelli in numero e in meriti, si rivolse agli undici, lui che era il dodicesimo, guida e padre del gruppo. Fratelli, vedo che il Signore misericordioso vuole aumentare la nostra comunità. Andiamo dunque dalla nostra madre, la Santa Chiesa Romana, e comunichiamo al Sommo Pontefice ciò che il Signore ha cominciato a fare per mezzo di noi. Al fine di continuare la nostra missione, secondo il suo volere e le sue disposizioni. Il Papa, dopo aver considerato attentamente da un lato quel frate in abito strano, dal volto disprezzabile, barba lunga, capelli incolti, sopracciglia nere e pendenti, e dall'altro quella petizione che egli presentava, così ardua e impossibile secondo il giudizio comune, lo disprezzò nel cuor suo e gli disse «Vai, fratello, cercati dei porci a cui saresti da paragonare più che agli uomini. Allora ravvoltolati con loro nel fango». Francesco non frappose in dugio, ma subito a capo chino se ne uscì. Faticò non poco a trovare dei porci, ma quando finalmente si imbatté in un branco di essi, si ravvoltolò con loro nel fango. Il gigante che scoprì il sole e spogliò il cielo delle nubi per far ardere di luce cuori rabbuiati si svuota del luminoso suo tesoro. Di abbassamento si trattò fino ad assumere il colore stesso della terra. Il gigante si abbassò e la chiesa fu salva un'altra volta. Si eclissò e tornò la luce. Non disse una parola a sua difesa. L'antidoto al male antico della volontà aveva tra le labbra chiuse e il ginocchio si piegò senza ipocrisia. Il gigante si abbassò e il pascolo fu conferma di parola detta. Va, ed egli andò. Un altro minore venne a trovarsi al pascolo dei porci non c'è similitudine più lontana 
L'esplosione di amore soltanto gli eguagliò. L'uno vi si trovò in conseguenza di peccato, fino in basso, per supponente pretesa. Il gigante, invece, rientrò in se stesso, poi ascoltò e andò. Venne il padre a cercarlo e il padre lo esaltò. Nel miserabile nascondimento non rivelò il segreto del gran re. Non preparò discorso per accendere serafici lumi, né per rimarcare umiltà. Nella nudità del basco fu visto risplendere dal basso. Il mondo seppe e non dimenticò. Il gigante si abbassò, fu rialzato da un sogno e il sogno regge ancora. and Muslim economist Rajid Ghanema reveals something about the complex semantics of poverty when he distinguishes between different forms of poverty. La pauvreté que ma mère et mon grand-père Sufi The poverty chosen by my mother and my grandfather as Sufi, like the great poor of Persian mysticism, that of certain poor people in the neighborhood where I spent the first 12 years of my life, that of women and men in a society in the process of modernization with too low an income to enter the race of needs created by society. The poverty connected to the unbearable hardships suffered by a multitude of human beings reduced to living in humiliating miser misery. And lastly, that represented by the moral poverty of the wealthy classes and some social environments I have come across in the course of my professional career. was struck by the inequality between poor and rich in his city. He first burst into gesture of generosity, then he decided to become poor. Other wealthy young people like him become poor to follow the gospel. The Franciscans' observance in 50th century gave birth to the amounts of piety, the first form of popular banks without interest and profit. So, that first dispossession of Francis generated banks. That first gratuitousness gave birth to an economy and a civilization of gratuitousness that has liberated and continues to free multitudes of poor people. Only those who are familiar with gratuitousness can give life to new economies, as gratuitousness gives the right value to money, profits, and finance. You don't change the economy without new finance. This 
Those are the gates of the palace of Mount Frumentario in Assisi. Born as an ancient hospital, it was built in 1267. The Mount Frumentario were mutualistic institutions. Here, the loans were paid in cereal commodities for sowing, which, once the harvest had taken place, were returned under the established conditions, depending on the yield of the year. The Mounts of Piety were born in response to a crisis due to urban poverty. They were the first banks for the poor. From the freely chosen poverty of the Franciscans, institutions without interest, sin emerito, and non-profit institutions were born. Those institutions had the purpose of freeing the poor who had not chosen poverty, but suffered from it. Banks had existed for some time in Europe, but they lent money to the rich. Where there are not just inferior banks, usury comes. The Franciscans of the Reform promoted these institutions as means of treating poverty and fighting usury. When there is a poor person in the city, they said, it is the whole city that falls ill. Poverty must be cured. Francis is not the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven as poor. But after the poor man of Assisi, it is no longer possible to go without its poverty to truly understand the one arising from the Beatitudes. Otherwise, charisms would be merely private experiences. Francis is the teacher of the Beatitude of Poverty the different joy of another kingdom. Whenever someone chooses to become poor, meet Francis, even if they don't recognize it, even if they don't know it.
economy and finance have always been decisive areas in people's lives. In every age, banks, savings, and work have represented the framework in which many of the most important things in life took place. Today, we are in the midst of a global crisis. We need new financial institutions that can manage the period during and after COVID, which will leave the world even more unequal with people who are even poorer. We need a new financial system that corresponds to the needs of a humanity today. We cannot respond to a humanity that has changed forever by eliminating finance, but by means of a different and more humane finance. Like the Franciscans of the 15th century, who while criticizing usurious finance, created hundreds of different banks for the poor. Every time a generation of dreamers wanted to change the world, the Franciscans, the cooperative movement, they created different kinds of banks and new financial institutions. ancient creation called Mounds of Piety tells us that banks and money are human creations. Banks and money should not be demonized because when we demonize them, they truly become demons. They must be treated as life is treated. Faced with a financial system that increases poverty, we can and must respond, creating a different financial system to reduce poverty. But the new Mounts of Piety, different from those in the 15th century, will not emerge from rich merchants, for-profit bankers, but from those who know the poor, recognize their dignity, and love them because they have received the charism. The new Mounts of Piety won't arise exclusively from the poor either, but rather among friends of the poor. The Franciscan friars were not the owners of the mounts. They were instead the promoters and animators of the processes that created those banks. Today, we need new Franciscans like them, people who know and love the poor and who, instead of cursing the economy and the financial system, construct a new one. Oi pessoal, I am Mariana Resmaria and I'm here today to talk a little bit about who I am and what I am doing to change the economy. I am a Brazilian economist and currently I am a PhD student also in economics at the University of Campinas in Brazil. Um, I study especially the energy transition since my master and now in my PAD, I am focusing on the impact of green finance on the energy sector investment decisions. 
I can say a complexity economic approach um, where I use um, instruments like uh, social network analysis and aided-based uh, models. I am also a proudly participant of the economy of Francesco from the Energy and Poverty Village, where I, especially I've been working with the research group and I've been researching especially on issues like the Social New Deal and energy access and also uh, policies to tackle the unemployment impacts from the energy transition. Um, I felt part of the movement uh, actually since 2015, before it exists, uh, because in 2015 I was strongly influenced by the Encyclica Laudato Si. I was starting my master and deciding at a thematic to research and after read the Encyclica I realized that I couldn't um, research anything else without putting the, the ecolo ecology um, in the center. I already like it a lot, the energy transition thematic, and I decided to start uh, studying it. And now in my PhD, as I've said, I studied it in, with this investment focus, but also, always I have this background um, related to uh, the uh, an ecology, integral ecology perspective. So um, I feel the economy of Francesco much more than a movement, much more than an event. Actually, I feel and I know my colleagues agree with me as a call, a long term commitment to rethink the economy. Uh, as a young economist, a woman economist, um, I would like so much to help uh, to build a new economy, to much more um, much more fairer, sustainable, um, inclusive, uh, that look to the, to, to the excluded, uh, his, historically excluded um, people, like indigenous, indigenous people, uh, the poorer, poorer countries, and uh, um, I would like so much to be part of it as a young economist, to rethink this economy that is not connected to the, all these challenges and demands we have. And I am very, very happy to be part of the economy of Francesco. Um, I feel that we are, um, we are building a long-term commitment together um, with fraternity and uh, much, much love. And I appreciate so much Pope Francis' uh, support. And let's do it, guys. If you don't give up on me now, just a matter of time before it all falls down And I'll be chasing the lottery And drinking up to sleep Well, I'm a sinner, I ain't no saint You've been dragging me out of the darkest ways Cause you've always believed that I was meant for greater things And sometimes I swear I wish that you were right But I keep on walking further from the light There's a fire in my veins I was a loner, I had no dreams Wouldn't 
try to soar with these broken wings Till you made me believe that I could reach into the sky If I could jump back into time There's not a single word that I wouldn't write Till I'd written a song so good And flawless as you are So come on darling now don't you slow this down Hand over your heart, keep mine in your town. There's a fire in my veins, and I can't put out the flames when it's time for greater things. And it's time. Greater things Thank you, Christovam, for this wonderful song, Greater Things. And now, Jenna, how is life there behind the scene? Uh, social media right now is very active, actually. And so I want to read to you some comments that people have been giving this past few hours. There's Noemi Sanchez who said, it's so beautiful seeing and feeling this harmony between you guys here on the, sta on the stage. And another one from Kevin Moynihan. He says, after the um, performance of Valentino, he says, music is indeed the international language of hope. Thank you, he says. Jose Aranas says, wow, great song, great collaboration, great message. We gather together right now. Fabio Maggi. I will say it in Italian. I, I appreciated the presentation, which was very balanced between men and women, especially that on artificial intelligence, though. Okay. It was only men who presented that. Grazie. Molto interessante. Espero Thank you. Very interesting. I hope to go along this conversion. Mohammed Yunus, and I hope we can find later on a way to communicate this to him. So basically, that's it, guys. Thank you, Jenna. Thank that's you. That's great. That's great to hear everything from them. And now, yes, I think. We will have another song, maybe? Yes, another song of Miado. <laughs> Take a 
Wow, thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Raquel, for this beautiful song, Follow the Sun. Let's follow our hearts. Now, let's continue with the last talk session of the day. We will talk about an economy of abundance, how to foster bottom-up development with Van Vandana, Shiva, and Paulina Eva. And for those who stay on this channel, work and care. New pillars for work with Jennifer Nedelsky, Paolo Fol Folizo, and Francesco Barroni. We also remind you that the workshop, a new education for new economy, has started a few minutes ago for young people who have booked to participate. Thanks to Professor Michael Spence, Rob Johnson, Peter Buffinger, Nelson Barbosa, Luca Crivilli, Leonardo Beschitti, and, and many others for this very inspiring workshop. So, we just have to start now, and which wish everyone good luck. Now, let's immediately hand the floor over to Domenico Rosinoli for the session dedicated to work and care. Domenico, are you there? Can you hear me? We cannot hear you well. We can can't you hear try? you well. Sorry. <laughs> no. ah, good, it's great. On. Okay, so the floor yeah. is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to welcome you all here for this parallel uh, panel session, the new pillars of work. Uh, welcome to all the people that are attending here. 
and online and also really, uh, really warm welcome to our guests that accepted to share part of their time of this afternoon for taking part to the panel. I want to thank Jennifer Nadeski, political theorist who supported us, our village, from the very beginning of the process. I also thank Paolo Foglizzo, journalist working at the journal Aggiornamenti Sociali, who has also been very active in supporting our, uh, our village, especially about the issues of decent work. And uh, also really thank you, Francesco Baroni, country manager for G Group in Italy, who is partnering with our village, providing also a business perspective, perspective through his deep experience. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of the village working care that I had the pleasure to coordinate together with Georgia Nigri, who is now in the backstage. Hi, Georgia, and thank you. Um, I must confess that I am really excited that we finally got here because, you know, the participants of our village have done a lot of work in these last months to prepare for this moment. Since March, we have engaged in webinars, interactive sessions, exchanged tons of emails, messages, phone calls, in a nutshell. Thanks to Economy of Francesco, we ignited the process and now we are really, really part of it. So. Uh, Thank you to all of you for this. But among all the outcome of our work, let me please mention one in particular. Uh, thanks to the work of a lot of participants and to the to senior experts and also to the great effort of uh, uh, Frate Andrea Riccati, a, a young Franciscan friar who is a member of our village. We also produce a small booklet that uh, our young guys like to refer to as a sort of encyclical, let's say, <laughs> representing the shared views of our village. The title of this booklet is in Italian, La Grazia di Lavorare, so the grace of work. Well, well in this booklet, what we did is to, to review the thinking of St. Francis and uh, also of later Franciscan authors on the idea of work finding inspiration for our, for our own discussion and also for our uh, proposal. Uh, in St. Francis, to be able to work is considered a grace. So it's a gift from God. And indeed, we know that the church teaches us that working makes us cooperators of God's plan on humanity, since we are all called to keep and till the garden he created for us. So working care must be taken very seriously. And this is what we try to do. And that's why we are here today. Uh, of course, we, we don't think we have reached any definite conclusion. Rather, we believe that today we are setting a new starting point for the future, aiming at a season 2021. And we had to have all you, you uh, our partners also helping us to, to get there. But so now uh, I will really stop myself and I would, I would really like to give the floor to, our, uh, to the core of our village, to the protagonists of, of this process. So our young participants and especially Simon Dumpelman, uh, Thomas Maynard Kuda and Emanuele Lepore, who are here representing the whole village and are here to present our proposal to all of you. Then after their, their proposal, uh, the three guests that are here with us, we will uh, interact with our uh, with uh, with our uh, participants. We have uh, we have let five six minutes for each one of you. I know that it is not a lot of time, but you know, unfortunately, we have uh, re a really tight schedule. So uh, we will try to do our best, and and then in the end, we will try to to find if we are able to. To, to find a, a conclusion about all we have uh, discussed today. So, Simone, Thomas, and Emanuele, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your work, and let we are here to, to see what you are presenting us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Domenico. Thank you to all of you attending this great meeting. I would just like to show for a moment a cover of you, the booklet you just mentioned, because it's really nice and i think it quite got to to, to our point the need to uh, uh, put our hand at works in this great in the great project that uh, the economy of francesco actually actually is so thank you for your effort and the effort of all the uh, of the committee now uh, as soon simon will 
with such a presentation. Let's just me uh, just let me thank all of our uh, fellow citizens in our village and let's get straight to our points as to our presentation. I'm just sharing it and here we are. So how our village proposal has uh, has been a collective product and our re actual focus is work and care in this uh, in the vivifying link our uh, just uh, a few words about our process because uh, it was a village activity and the first point uh, about which we we should thank uh, the, the the committee and pope francis for this great initiative is that it gave us the opportunity to to leave a community building process and take uh, uh, give us the opportunity to really focus the theme of work and care working uh, uh, taking care of each other. Uh, it's not. It's not to take for granted. Uh, our process has came up with live webinars uh, involving entrepreneur, change makers, and young researchers. Our uh, proposal process uh, start with a survey. Uh, the first part uh, of surveying participants for personal expertise, experience, to share common beliefs and fix, set up common, common goals. Our areas of relevance uh, um, is now mirrored in the first draft we are presenting to you. And of course, we do need uh, time and effort for all of us uh, to, to empower our, our, proposal, our proposal because it is a collaborative writing and thinking process within the extended project team. So this is the first uh, version of our proposal we would like to share with you and we are, you are more than welcome to, to write us with proposal and engage in this great process. Uh, the proposal is around some core values and which start with analysis of the, the team of labor and care with a focus about policy and uh, in attention to some political recommendation about these these uh, these themes. In our methodology, we we try to to took stock of a global combination of perspective, issues, and suggestion. At a global level proposal, we just uh, focus on abstract universal values from the social, the Christian social doctrine, and try to, to, to sketch out our common goal. And the first one is a more decent work, because as Professor Nadeski uh, um, uh, remember us, if we do not change the way in which we think and expertise uh, labor, we cannot change the way uh, in which we think and experience the, uh, the care activity. So we just sketch out some needs uh, we, we think uh, have to be applied regarding specific regional context. And I will leave the floor to, to my friend and fellow citizen, citizen Thomas. Uh, we, for a focus on the Latin American experience and context. Our proposal is a starting point for improvement and at a first level for an improvement of our experience as young researchers and, and young laborers. We just, uh, we know that it is neither perfect nor exhaustive, and that's the reason why we need to dialogue with you and we need uh, to interact with you to foster our proposal and to potential tie in with analogous initiative in other fields, not only a cultural or social one. The core concept of our presentation is the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic dimension of labor. In order to achieve a better understanding of the notion of labor and then develop it in the fields of care and in cultural, political, economic, and social sense, and uh, not the least in a, spirit, in a spiritual sense, we we are trying to focus such kind of a holistic notion of labor and achievement and productivity to abandon a materialistic or just monetary conception of labor and try to, to, to sketch out a notion that could mirror our needs as, uh, as laborers, as, 
and as human beings. Our analysis just focused on globalization, digitalization, and the ecological overconsumption of our resources in order to sketch out what change uh, we, we think are, are required in the, in the labor skills, as to the labor skills. And for the third point, we just came up with some recommendation of policies and action in order to, uh, to foster policies that could actually support this decent work and not leave our proposal just in an abstract uh, dominion of thought. And uh, we came up with some proposal we, uh, as to inclusive and community-related self-developmental tasks. As to the policies, our focus is on social protection and work-life balance. Uh, because our conviction, our shared belief is that we need to, to address the team and the task to take care of uh, uh, each other. Uh, because otherwise we can we cannot really achieve our goals to uh, our common goal to 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 mold a better economical uh, global economical system our uh, the logical link of our proposal is mediated by the conception of labor as you can see from between the mega trend and the policies so between the theoretical reflection and the actual concrete fields uh, where we can act to, to promote a progressive process of transformation. This is our overall picture, but uh, as to the concept of labor, I will just try uh, to, to stress out the difference between intrinsic dimension and intrinsic dimension of labor. On the first hand, we have the gainful labor. So an economic logic that we have to do to, to focus on and the intrinsic, the intrinsic dimension that uh, tell us to, to focus on a kind of fulfilled labor. And it's not just a, an ethical or sp spiritual logic. It's the most human logic we can focus on. So together we just try to work on labor as vocation as a natural activity of the human person. So decent work is just the most human version of work. And uh, this way we, we, we worked with concepts like achievement, productivity in a holistic sense. So our concept of economy as, not ours, but uh, the concept of economy we were working with as uh, accommodating both dimension of labor, the intrinsic and the extrinsic one, rewarding multiple dimension of achievement. And our references were on one end, the, for example, the, uh, the honor economy of Rewood, Professor Rewood, or the Economia Civile, and on the other end, the Christian social doctrine. Now I will like to leave the stage to, to Thomas because the Latin American experience is just something we really like to, 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 to focus on. Thank you very much, Manuel. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just confirm you are seeing this. So here, there you go. Okay, so thank you very much, Emmanuel. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Tomas Mainara, I'm from Argentina, and I'm going to show the practical part of our proposal, uh, what Francis Bob called Concretezza. As Emmanuel mentioned, what we are going to say next is a practical example of this base and values applied to specifically and to our Latin American region. We, what we are about, what I'm about to explain uh, is a product of our Latin American fishbowl from work and care. Before starting work, um, I would like to clarify that from our, our Latin American perspective, we agree with Prof. Nedelsky when she claims that in our society, it's almost impossible um, for government decisions to be made by people who work in care and therefore who work in care and in, who work in care activities will never have the real possibility of accessing and making decisions. 
For this reason, the central act of our proposal is to correct this distortion and ensure that people and the popular knowledge, which is in constant contact with the reality of the bodies and their demands, has guaranteed access uh, to political decisions. Before we start work, it was, an essential, it was essentially to carry on a preliminary analysis of the situation. As you can see in the graph, um, we follow the Latin American method, see, judge, and work. Um, in, a term, in Latin America, we are united not only by our culture, but also um, by, our, by our history. In, in years of developing on an economy based on financial speculation, ended up deeply the little industrial development that some country has if they hire at all, destroying economies and making cuts of public uh, of public investment, pushing a large number of workers to an informal sector where organization and labor claims are not an option. The main economy activity of our region is exploitation of natural resources, which damage seriously the environment and still do not create the jobs that our population needs. COVID-19 has put on the table the discussion about universal income that even in some countries has begun to be uh, implemented. But it's, that is not enough. To fully feel ourselves as people, we need to work, to be creative, feel, feel our spirit and not only maintain our body. We are creative in an image and likeness of God precisely because of that, because we create. So what should we do specifically to make a state commitment developing um, integrating the popular economy of finally achieve a regional integration. We believe that to make a structural change, we must be able to guarantee decent work, universal assets to common goods and solidarity between us. So how do we achieve this? First of all, we believe that education is the right way and therefore the creation and development of the university of the popular economy are essential place where the accumulated knowledge of the community will be exchanged by creating space and debate and discussions where the community will be begin to have its own entity and taking part in the political decisions. Universal access to common goods will be fundamental pillar to achieve a social economic integration in a region. Latin America is a very large con continent with a centralized demographic where many lands are not being used as we believe they could be used. National park, ecological reserve, eco park, and states should be used to promote ecotourism, which would not only be a great source of employment to our communities, but would also put them in permanent contact with care of the common home and therefore reestablish the value between work and care as care as work, as Professor Nedelsky pointed out. Finally, we believe that none of this would be possible without, uh, without a, sol a solidarity of all Latin Americans. But the truth is that until now, we have always depended on, on goodwill of the people and look where we stand. Some believe that COVID-19 will show our true human face, but it's, it's, but it's hard to believe that until now, we've been living on a lie all these years, being someone we are not. This is not true. COVID has only deepened inequalities. This is why we believe that political participation as a maximum expression of love is essential to achieve state modernization, where solidarity must be institutionalized through progressive taxes that guarantee that everyone has access to credit and those ensures the community develop productive and sustainable cooperatives. Once again, our proposal is a collection of what was discussed in our Latin American fishbowl, which would not, not be even possible with the help of Augusto Martin, Nicolás del Mastro, um, Ilén Fernández, our senior collaborator, Humberto Ortiz, Emil Secuda, and of course, Georgia and Melissa. And thank you, everyone. And Simon, I give you the floor. Excellent. Thanks very much. Could uh, somebody, Emanuele or Tomas, could you share the screen for the last slide? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 we're getting there. No. <laughs> Try. 
Try again. Yeah. So sorry about that. Terrific. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks very much. Um, sorry, I had a little bit of a technical issue with the connection. The internet didn't appear to work it with the, with the, with the platform. So sorry for, um, for for connecting late. Emanuela, thank you so much for delivering the first part of the presentation. Um, right, it's up to me then to deliver the conclusion. So uh, you've heard our proposal. Um, you've heard about the values we emphasize and the values uh, on which we started this journey. And you heard about the concept. I mean, really explained it to you on which we, um, um, which we, which we then set up. Um, you heard how we see the world of work as it is, the analysis that we gave, and the analysis of where we think it's heading. Um, and you've heard the proposition, the proposal of actions and policy steps that we deem are realistic and uh, suitable in order to change something for the better. Um, Reflecting on the process that we've gone through together, it's been uh, long. <laughs> it's been long. Uh, we've been working on this for, for, for nearly a year by now. Um, but we've been careful. I mean, like the title of the village was Work and Care, and we've been careful. We've been careful with, with each other. We've, we had loads of differing opinions. There were opinions certainly that weren't, for some people weren't, including myself maybe, that weren't sort of like, easy to stomach, but um, we did it nonetheless. We worked carefully with, with each other in order to come up with something. Uh, and it was a good bit of work. It was arduous uh, in order to come up with something that is um, in which everybody of the team can find themselves. Uh, so it was a global collaboration. It was across regions. It was across cultures. Um, and it is quite, um, quite an undertaking. Um, but what we got from that is really something remarkable in times of a pandemic and in times of in times of uh, um, a setting where most of social life is digital so and so often because like what we got from that was a bond of friendship also i mean uh Emanuele, who then the, the first part of the presentation i've never met him in person um i call him a friend though and i mean it absolutely um so this is something this is something remarkable i think um and we found we found our own engagement mirrored in the others in a way. We found that people all over the world have maybe not exactly the same idea, but a similar impetus, a similar vision, a similar idea where things should be headed and a similar idea and a similar vision and a similar also drive to do something for the better. Um, so this is something that has given an incredible lot of motivation and possibly also hope every time I look at the news. Um, so this is something I'm really grateful for. Thomas, next slide, please. Thomas? Great. Um, so what is then going to follow? Um, first of all, we're going to get feedback, obviously, because um, this has been, as I said, this has been quite a process and there have been a number of people involved. So as much as we were interested in what people are thinking in the build-up to this proposal, we are think we 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 are like concerned now of what they're thinking now of how they feel about it. So this is what we're going to do. We get feedback. Um, of course, we've delivered quite some work, and the presentation you've seen today is only the uh, the peak in a way, um, uh, the peak of the iceberg. Um, underlying this is a <laughs> at the moment thirty pages long proposal, which needs to be finalized, edited, then and then also published. Obviously, it needs to go out. Um, so. This would be the first step then for the follow-up process, for gathering more ideas on what to do with the material we have amassed, with uh, the proposal we have written so far. Um, a, can, a central point will be reaching out, finding allies in a way, spreading the word and getting the ideas, which we have drafted now out, um, and then think about how we are able to, how we can adopt it actually. Um, finding demo cases, finding proof points, finding little projects that show that actually the proposal that we have drafted will work. And um, the last thing I think all of us are very much looking forward to is actually meeting each other in person once the pandemic is over. So we're all quite looking forward to next year when hopefully there will be a vaccine, hopefully the pandemic will be under control, and hopefully we will then be able to meet in Assisi or in Rome or wherever and see each other and talk to each other in person because this is something, this is something um, I think 
all of us would deem the next step of inspiration. So this would be something like a personal note on there to the next steps. All right. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much for listening. And now um, I think it's time for the discussion. Thomas, please. Right. Um, so first of all, to all the people watching us, um, if you've got questions, there are two ways to um, two ways to get them to us. Um, first one, if it's a longer, sort of like more substantial content-related question, do send us an email. People will reply. Maybe not exactly tomorrow because we're going to collect questions first, but people will reply. Send an email, please, to eofworkandcare at gmail.com. Um, also, if you've got questions, reactions, shout outs, and so on and so forth, there's our YouTube channel on which you're probably watching this, uh, and there's a comment section. Feel free to use it. Um, and with this said, we're going to enter the discussion. We've got three amazing people here. We've got Jennifer Nadelsky, philosopher, Canadian philosopher, who's been quite for a while working on uh, ideas of work and care and how to organize it better. Thank you, Simon. We've got Thank you, Simon. We have we have some questions actually. We have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so thank you guys for your presentation. So, um, well, what what I what I would like to do now is to um, to try to to put some of the questions to our uh, to our guests, starting first of all uh, with Professor Nadeski. Uh, so um, we we got. From our village, these, uh, uh, this perspective emerged of work as both an intrinsic and an extrinsic um, dimension, so important for your own aspirations, but also for because you know you need to work for for, for a living. So what people ask here is: Should we expect that care is culturally perceived as work? Or is it necessary for the state to legally recognize all care activities as paid work and therefore to equalize all workers in rights? In other words, reducing social inequality is a matter of education or of cohesions or, or of what? Thank you. Oh, you, you need to unmute. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here and to see a whole village uh, thinking about work and care together. I think that's that's so important. Um, and I and I really appreciated the references to being careful with one another in the work, because as we try to rethink what work and care mean, that gets very close to people's identities, things they care a lot about and feel vulnerable about. And so it's uh, when we want to make deep changes there, we need to be careful with one another. So to respond to the specific question um, about recognizing care as work. Uh, so, of course, we do have to recognize the dimensions of work that are part of care. But the proposal that my colleague Tom Mallison and I are working on does not call for paying, say, domestic work in the home as the solution to recognizing its value. On the contrary, what we call for is that everybody, with no exceptions at all, participates in the basic work of care that is now done as unpaid care overwhelmingly by women. So we want to restructure work, particularly in reducing the hours of work and reducing the idea of what is an ideal worker as somebody who thinks work comes before everything else, we want to change those things so that everybody can participate in care, unpaid care, as well as everybody having good access to good work. And so now we build into our understanding of decent work, work that makes it possible for everyone to be both a worker and an active carer. Do so you let me know if you want me to elaborate more or wait for further questions? Well, thank you. No, thank you for your for your point. Maybe I will now um, move uh, to to our, our other guests, and, and maybe in the end we will. So we will we will have time to wrap up or to expand a little bit. Thank you very much. Um, so I have another question now for okay for um, so Francesco Baroni, please. Um, so. Uh, your um, so, so your firm so G Group addresses the theme of sustainable work with a, a truly innovative drive for what we can we can say we can know. Thus, trying to adjust the mismatch between demand and offer of labor. How 
do you think this very big issue in the market um, of labor can integrate with our proposal if you think this is possible at all? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks uh, to the organizers for this fantastic event and uh, thanks uh, in particular to uh, Professor Luigi Bruni, to the Scientific Committee, to Professor Domenico Rossignoli and Giorgia Nigri for giving me uh, the opportunity to attend the Work and Care uh, Village. I agree with many of the observations, contributions and proposals that uh, emerged during uh, this roundtable and uh, uh, I strongly agree uh, the conception of work that uh, has been expressed by you and by uh, the last encyclical of uh, Pope Francis. Having a few minutes, I will skip any presentation of myself and uh, J Group and I go straight to uh, the point. Uh, looking at the shifts affecting the world of work at global level and starting from our daily activities and experiences in more than 50 countries, we realized how, how urgent it is to apply the concept of sustainability to work. We asked ourselves what sustainable work is and we have given it this definition. Sustainable work means achieving living and working conditions that support people in uh, engaging and remaining in work throughout an extended working life. Uh, work must be transformed to eliminate the factors that discourage or hinder workers from staying in uh, or entering the workforce. This definition uh, focuses on the concept of employability. And this is why we think that there is a strong relationship between sustainable work and mismatch between demand and offer for labor. Mismatch, in fact, is a matter of skills, market labor rules, and conception of uh, work. This is why it's really important uh, to improve uh, employability in the best possible way, and uh, this imply the strong uh, collaboration of all stakeholders in the labor market, people, companies, and uh, policy makers. Employability, in fact, requires people uh, to be aware of the meaning and value of work in order to be able to face, uh, uh, with the right motivation, the hard work and the challenge of a continuous learning and development path that begins with school, but must never end. Uh, people educated to be aware of their talents in order to face work transition phases with the courage and determination, without losing sight of their psychophysical well-being and uh, their role in society. In other words, people able to take care of themselves and of their neighbors. Uh, employability requires healthy companies able to respond quickly and effectively to changes and to market challenges, but uh, at the same time able to generate and distribute value not only to the owners, but also to their employees and their territories through fair wages, inclusiveness, welfare, practices, uh, uh, and continuing training investments. In other words, companies able to take care of all their stakeholders. Finally, employability requires policymakers able to assure healthy collaboration between public and private sectors. Guidance, education, and professional training, active employment policies, flex security rules, uh, and such a useful activities as a way to ensure maximum inclusiveness and welfare policies that strengthen the generational path. In other words, policymakers are able to take care of society and the common good. Let me emphasize in particular three aspects of this holistic approach to employability that I believe are particularly important to uh, reduce mismatch. Vocational guidance and training, flexibility, 
and active employment policies. Vocational guidance and training are increasingly the only effective services that allow people to enter the world of work and stay active. Uh, the speed of the changes introduced by digital innovation requires a great effort to maintain the required skill. And even if web technologies uh, have improved the accessibility to knowledge, it's really essential to guide candidates and workers and to design training contents aligned with the profiles required by company. Flexibility. Uh, flexibility is not synonymous with precariousness. Flexibility is, is an intrinsic characteristic of markets and is becoming a new way of conceiving one's work and work-life balance. Flexibility means greater job opportunities and greater ability to adapt to the evolution of the market and to maintain companies' competitiveness. All those policies and rules that are uh, able of combining flexibility and employment continuity must be stimulated and supported. Valuable intermediaries can make a difference and can assure effective services. Finally, the active labor policies. Public intervention must focus on keeping people active. Other forms are not sustainable uh, expect for emergencies and short periods. Mainly, individuals must be protected and supported, not the workplaces. Furthermore, the involvement of unemployed people must be rewarded in a socially useful job. I'm going to close. Our privilege observation point allows us to say that uh, there are many best practices and experiences that, if disseminated and promoted, could make the difference. At the same time, uh, the rapid change in the market requires creativity and mutual help to face the new global challenges according to the perspective of sustainable work and sustainable welfare policies as hoped for in the encyclical Brother Soul. Since GI Group was founded by Stefano Collilanzi 22 years ago, his mission has been to contribute as a key player and on a global basis to the evolution of the labor market and to emphasize the personal and social value of work. According to our mission, we are available to collaborate with anyone interested in exploring these issues, in sharing concrete experiences, lessons learned and projects, and in developing new ideas and solutions. I hope to be able to resume this confrontation over the next year, because I think that these points are decisive for setting up a new way of doing economy. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now I have uh, another another question I would like to to ask Paolo Foglito, and then I would like to come back to Jennifer Nedeschi that uh, you you've been really synthetic, so you I will let you a few minutes more to expand on your uh, on your thoughts. So um, so let me go back to the other question I got here. So um, for Paolo. In our proposal, we have taken stock of the importance of networking for it is a crucial concept in our current system. So how can we use networking to empower our proposal and to translate it into a transformative and progressive process in cultural, economic and social terms? So to, let's say, move our proposal out from the paper and to make it really, uh, uh, yeah, really, really live. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Domenico. Uh, thank you for your question and thank you for the chance to be here. It's really ex exciting after so much time. Uh, first of all, before replying to the question, I want to say good afternoon, good evening or good morning to everybody. And going back to the question, yes, I do agree that networking is crucial, but I feel some qualifications are needed. In a way, networking is a plural notion. There are many different types of networks among main diverse kinds of actors. Consultancy firms network 
big business network when they want to win an important contract. So networking can be something very operational, maybe anonymous, something very technical or even technocratic, if we want to use this word from Laudato Si. So the first thing I want to say and stress is that we need a different kind of network. And here I draw inspiration from another passage in Laudato Si, number 219, when uh, the notion is proposed of community networks. My opinion is that the idea behind it is that we need a new kind of actors that can combine the effectivity and the global outreach of networks, their capacity to use digital communications, with the warmth and the richness of the emotional bonds, which is typical of communities. In the project I have been involved during the past three years and some of the villagers here too, which is called the future of work, labor after Laudato Si, we came up with a similar insight and we proposed the idea of transformative global communities. The word transformative was also in your question. And why community bonds are so important? Because they sap into the energies of people's emotions. You can network out of self-interest, but to form a community uh, is generosity and dedication are required. And when people feel a sense of belonging, which is typical of communities, they immediately start to care, even when they work. So this is very important if you want to explore and build upon the link between work and care. And this link is intrinsic to the holistic notion of work that was illustrated before and which I thoroughly share. So when people feel they belong to a community, they become creative, they find new energy, and this energy is the basis, is the fuel to propel change. In the world of work, change has always happened through the action of people they felt that belong, that formed a community. For instance, this is how the cooperative movement and the trade unions were born, and there is clearly the idea of forming a community behind the very notion of the common good. So today, again, we need this sense of belonging if we want to bring about change. And as Simon uh, said before, during the preparation of this event, bonds have started to grow. Therefore, my hope and my wish is that these days will make these bonds stronger and that the economy of Francesco can evolve into a community network and work with many others to make our proposals for change come true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. And so uh, coming back to Jennifer Nadeski, would you like to, to add something, maybe to expand a little bit more on your point? Thank you. I would. You can hear me? Yes. So, so first, uh, I just want to ask everyone, when they talk about their vision of work, are they picturing a division of labor? Are they imagining that the workers they are talking about has somebody else who's doing the care for their families? Or are they picturing that those workers are going to also be the ones doing the care? Our presupposition has always been a division of labor. The division of labor has brought us inequalities. It's brought us what we call the care policy divide. The people who make the important decisions are people who know nothing about care and it's brought us very stressed families. So I think this is a tremendously important thing. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, but the big part about the proposal that my colleague and I have is not only that everybody does unpaid care, but everybody does less paid work. There's a, a norm, not a law, but a norm of reduction in work hours to a maximum of 30 hours. And this is tremendously important because part of what shapes so much of the culture, particularly of rich societies, is time scarcity. And I think time scarcity interferes hugely in the issues of generosity and the capacity to build community that were just mentioned before. 
So let me just say a little bit more about our project. We see that a, a really good economy will be built uh, not only around just work, but about the centrality of care for a thriving society. Most contemporary societies do not treat care with respect. They allocate it to those people who are seen as lowest status, women, uh, racialized peoples, immigrants, that's who do it. And so the care is denigrated and so are the people who do it. And that is even though we know at some level that care is not only essential to our material well-being, um, but care is what makes the relationships possible that make life meaningful. So our whole approach is that a good economy must recognize that any structure of work relies on some underlying structure of care. Right now, workplaces are looking for workers who put work first. They assume, as I just mentioned, that somebody else is doing the care. We need an economy that does not work like that, where everyone has access to meaningful work and everyone is participating in the care that makes life possible and meaningful. So I'll just say very briefly, with uh, skipping all the details, which maybe we'll have a chance to come back to, but the idea is everybody does a minimum of 22 hours of unpaid care, first for their families, but then for wider communities. And nobody works more than 30 hours. And we think that this is immediately possible in the rich countries. And I'm going to come back to the issue of poor countries soon. And we think that this new mode would solve three huge problems uh, with the background of revaluing care, allowing everyone to understand what care really does in our societies. But it would change the huge stress that families are under. It would remove this care policy divide and it would make a big impact on inequality. Because as long as we build a core dimension of societies that is care provision around inequality, as, well, as long as it's organized around hierarchies, we can never have truly equal and just societies. So I, I've thought a lot about our immediate experience with COVID. And on the one hand, I think it's alerted everyone to the fact that work cannot get done unless somebody else is doing the care. But people seem to me, as I listen to the conversations in the newspapers and so on, they have remained slow to understand that the hours of work and the picture of the ideal worker are also going to have to change if everyone is going to have an equal chance at good work and the necessary care is going to be provided in a fair way. So I really want to thank Thomas for bringing forward the specifics of uh, issues around Latin America, many of which are poorer countries. And uh, we aim our particular argument at rich countries because we know uh, how that could be implemented. And we think that poor countries may have to implement this aspiration to build a commitment to care into re-envisioning economies in a different way. But what is the same for poor countries and rich countries is that as they're doing that re-envisioning, they can never hold care as a separate matter, as something for somebody else to worry about. They always have to ask, what are the, what are the workers they're envisioning doing with respect to care? And as I said, I think the division of labor, which um, world economies have relied on, is, is no longer an acceptable way of organizing care. It's a mistake also to aim for women's equality and economic prosperity by bringing more women into a paid labor force, which has not changed its structure. And it's a very good thing to urge men and to educate boys to take up their care responsibilities like Oxfam does and Promundo does. But if the structure of work is not changed, those efforts will fail. It will feel impossible to both rich and poor men to really take up their responsibilities for care unless the structure of work changes enough to enable that. So I really want to urge that poor countries can learn from the mistakes of rich countries. The human and environmental costs of expanding material production through unjust and unsustainable systems of work and care. We believe that all countries need radically new norms, again, I emphasize norms rather than law, of work and care that express a responsibility to care for one another, even if their paths to transition will look very different. Thanks.
Well, thank you, thank you very much for your further further um, uh, points. Um, well, I think we are uh, actually going to to the end of our of our event because we are supposed to finish in uh, in really a few minutes. So. Uh, let me just say well thank you to all of you for having participated into the uh, into into this this session um i would like to say that well as i anticipated in the at the very beginning we do not think we are getting to any definite conclusion today of course but we would like and to hope that today we are setting really a starting point for uh, a future work together. There's another appointment in front of us that is a CZ 2021, in which we, we will be called, hopefully, <laughs> in presence in a CZ. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully there we will be able to share again these thoughts, but having worked together and expanded these uh, more, more more in depth, as our uh, villager says, and I agree with them. During this time of working together, we we build a network, a new network, as Paolo suggested, and we you know we we have made new friendships, and we uh, we learn from each other, and hopefully we will be make these uh, all this process fruitful in the in the next uh, in the next months. Uh, I would like just to to highlight the main points that I, I think you have uh, you have uh, you have provided us as a gift today. So the the, nece the necessity to restructure the idea of work, to include the idea of care within work, and to re redistribute some way the burden of care and work within uh, our broader society, and. To do, do, to do this, we need to uh, probably also to, uh, to understand how work may be sustainable in the long term for every individual, for every person involved in the, um, in the job market. Um, and networking is essential in order to do this because this proposal, in order to, to become real, need to, to be implemented from, from the bottom but also need the support of the policymakers and communities, societies, all the stakeholders that are involved. So, uh, well, thank you really very much to all of you for these insights. And hopefully we will be together again in a year from now. And uh, well, have a, have a nice day, a nice week, and a nice uh, uh, follow up of this uh, Economy of Francesco event. Thank you to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you, thank Domenico, you so and thank all you. session speakers. Thank you very much. Here we are back again. Thanks to our friends, Melissa, Valentino, and Julia, <coughs> sorry, for taking us into different places in ICC. Now we are going to the Basilica of St. Clair. See you later. For the past 35 years, I focused on tackling some of the toughest issues of poverty. My work has given me the privilege to work with literally more than a thousand of the world's best change agents. I've seen that change is possible. Our companies and leaders have impacted more than 300 million low income people around the world. I've learned that the opposite of poverty is not income, it's dignity. That we have to learn to control markets, not be controlled by them. And that this is a moment in our history where together we need to move from systems that put profit at their center to those that insist on putting our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth there. That work is difficult. There's no roadmap for reimagining our systems. So at Acumen, my organization, we built a sort of moral compass, if you will, to help guide our decisions. 
and I'd like to share it with you. It starts by standing with the poor, listening to voices unheard and recognizing potential where others see despair. It demands investing as a means, not an end, daring to go where markets have failed and aid has fallen short. It makes capital work for us, not control us. It thrives on moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is and the audacity to imagine what it could be. It's having the ambition to learn at the edge, the wisdom to admit failure, and the courage to start again. It requires patience and kindness, resilience and grit, a hard-edged hope. It's leadership that rejects complacency, breaks through bureaucracy, and challenges corruption doing what's right, not what's easy. It's the radical idea of creating hope in a cynical world, changing the way the world tackles poverty and building one based on dignity. To each and every one of you, know that you are needed, and I wish you Godspeed. but I, I like to be positive about it because there's always hope we can always fix something. If there's a problem, we fix it. Nama saya Natalia. Hi, my name is Natalia. I live in Melbourne, Australia, and originally come from Indonesia. I work as cost analyst in property development, and I'm co-founder of The Water Jars, a movement that supports charities in the area of community development. Water Jars started in 2015, where my colleagues and I at work wanted to do something for the community but we're quite short of time and we don't really have the expertise to be doing so. So since then we've collaborated with charities and non-for-profit organizations so that we can bring impact more uh, effectively. I also serve as a board of directors in Entrust Foundation, which moves across 17 countries and works in the areas of education, water and sanitation, economic empowerment, and stopping human trafficking. In Australia right now, communities are suffering from the impact of bushfires. Uh, we had 12 million of lands burned down, and we've lost such a, a lot of diversities, biodiversities, and national parks, and uh, we're still recovering and still suffering from it right now. And also, the not so well covered news are floodings. We have floods in some part of Queensland. And so these two extreme weather events are also happening all across the globe. So we can no longer ignore the impact of climate change and how important it is for us now to be doing something about it, finding out a way and how to create a fair, sustainable and inclusive economy to be um, bringing a positive change for the environment, for our common home. Long afterward, Oedipus, old and blinded, walked the roads. He smelled a familiar smell. It was the Sphinx. Oedipus said, I want to ask one question. Why didn't I recognize my mother? You gave the wrong answer, said the Sphinx. But that was what made everything possible, said Oedipus. No, she said. When I asked, what walks on four legs in the morning, two at noon, 
and three in the evening, you answered man. You didn't say anything about women. When you say man, said Oedipus, you include women too. Everyone knows that, she said. That's what you think. was the first woman to join Francis' group. The night she left her, her father's house was a night of breaking up with her family and the code of conduct over time. After her, other young women came along. Francis wrote for them a short form of life, which over the years, Claire developed to compose her own rule. Her body still rests today in this basilica, dedicated to her. The evangelical and contemplative form of Claire and the poor sister's life, scattered today in all continents, has as its center the following of Jesus. In the silence of the cloister, everything gathers in prayer, both liturgical and personal, which becomes the breath of daily life. The Tavola del Mastro di Santa Chiara dates back to 1283. It is the first iconographic representation of Francis, the saint of Assisi. The sixth scene depicts of the miracle of the multiplication of bread. Let's hear it again from Tommaso da Celano, the narration of the biographer of Saint Clare. There was only one bread left in the monastery while the hour of hunger and dinner had come. Claire called the dispenser and told her to divide that bread in two. One part to pass to the friars, the other to keep inside for the sisters. Of the half withheld, she tells her to make 50 slices according to the number of sisters and place them on the table of poverty. That little quantity by divine gift grows in the end of the one who divided it. So to each of the monastery, touch it, its abundant portion. lies in her entering into the logic of absolute gratuitousness of the gift without calculation. Bread is a gift received from God. Claire cannot appropriate it. She cannot keep it all for herself. Instead, she looks at the needs of her sisters and brothers and she shares it with them, trusting in Providence, whose footprint in creation is superabundance. If Claire had entered into the more prudent logic of calculation and had not given half of the bread to her friars, the flow of God's gift would have been interrupted in Claire's hands. And instead, 
that little bread grows in the hands of those who break it. It is only the poor who know the civilization of the hundredfold. Claire's feminine economy, the secret of her life in the highest poverty, lies in her full trust in providence. Claire is free from the selfish possession of goods that makes us slaves to things and can share with those in need as a sister. Dependence on God the Creator, trust and sharing are the words with which Claire can be a gospel leaven for a more human, fraternal, and supportive economy. Claire becomes a gift because she feels she is a gift, because she accepts her own poverty as a person and recognizes herself as a sister in Christ to each of God's children and a sister in humanity.
women are the inhabitants and the protagonists of the oikos. They know, write, and live another oikonomia. It is part of the women's repertoire to immediately understand what to do in dramatic circumstances and to assess pace and timing. Practical and intelligent, they read relationships and then work for the common good out of an instinct for salvation. They are experts in relationships and care and peacemakers. They weave patterns of goodness at the service of life. They ponder in their hearts and then act, often in secret, because men would not understand. And quickly, women often act quickly. They, much more than men, do not like to stay in sick relationships. Acutely aware of the timing of life and the body, they know that time is the decisive factor in relational wounds. They are willing to take the blame while being innocent when necessary to heal a relationship or prevent the triggering of a spiral of revenge. It's not about who is right, who is wrong. Justice must yield to the good, to life. Later, when the books are closed, we'll see that the terms decided before the reconciliations are very different and worse than those made afterwards. We can all do this, but women know how to do it more with that vital instinct that leads them to choose life at any cost. comes in to give them my problems without collateral. They, we've seen them use their loan so very well. Um, someone can't access the funds without being part of our groups. So we encourage women to form up groups of 10, between 10 to 20, and we give them capital to start up businesses. Alongside that, we have our rescue to need resource Why the shelter is? Because most pregnant girls are stigmatized by the community. So what do we do? We get those girls and give them shelter. Over 100 girls sexually abused and pregnant. In our work in the field, we have really seen women go through a lot. They are living in a state of poverty, extreme poverty. We have seen women who have two meals in a week. We have seen women uh, who, who feed their children and they go hungry themselves. We have seen uh, people sleep down. We have seen uh, families who have never even experienced a bed in their entire lives. Uh, what we do as a foundation is to make sure 
these women can have their basic needs. We don't just give them, but we want to teach them how to work. They really have the capacity. All they need is a source of capital. So rescue women acts as a source of capital. We get those funds, give them to a lady, she uses it, we get it back and give to another person. That is what we are doing at the moment. And all the little profits we make are used to run the rescue teenage resource center. Thank you, Miriam, for these inspiring initiatives. We stay in my beautiful continent, Africa, and from Uganda, we go to Kenya to meet Fi and Kimutai. Hello, ladies. Karibu, Akuna Matata. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, Hi, nice to see you guys. Are you ready? We are. Yes, we are. The stage is yours. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Um, so I'm Chemutai Sage, and I'm joined by the lovely Fi. And the song we're gonna to perform today is titled Girl in a Blue Dress. And it's basically a comparison between a young girl and a grown woman. And how when you're a young girl, you have all these big dreams. And as you grow older, well-meaning people, um, they sort of talk you out of your dreams. And it's basically for those people who want to live on with their childhood dreams because anything is possible. Yeah, and even as we talk about you know, women in the economy, I think women are incubators of a lot of things, and not just even children, but ideas and concepts, and these things come from a place of care and love, and I think it's really unjust if we do not give women the platforms they deserve to get, if we don't give them the appreciation they deserve, and if we do not give them the voice uh, and enable them to actually have a voice. So this is for all the women out there who are watching from all over the world. And be free, like the girl in a blue dress.
Thank wow. you a lot, girls, for this beautiful <laughs> song. Beautiful. What a better way to end this second day's program. Thank yeah. you also to the entrepreneurs and senior members of our village that are doing private sessions, one-to-one -one talks with the economy of Francesco young villagers. Now we will start together the economy of Francesco marathon around the, the clock around the world. These 24 hours will be a time of vigil, of thinking and prayer, a 24 hours vi vigil for the victims of misery in the world for the victims of a type of economy that kills. To pay tribute to all those young people, children, who cannot live in the kind of life they dream of. We will not forget them as we joyful celebrate a new economy. So, we welcome Carlo Giardinetti, who introduces us to the marathon program. Carlo. Thank you so much, Kathleen. The sun has set here in Assisi, but we know very well that it's still uh, shining or about to set somewhere else in the world. What we've done today, this time, we have built a bridge into day three. And it's a bridge that looks much more like a rainbow. It's a trip, it's a journey that we're going to do together. We will start right now as we finish here, and we will travel around the world Hour by hour, we will start in Portugal, we will move to Spain, we will jump over the Atlantic Sea and we will reach Brazil, Argentina, and then Chile, Mexico, and then come back and go to Asia, Vietnam, Korea, and then in Africa, and then we will end tomorrow, just before we restart with day three program in Italy. So we are about to embark. The live marathon will be on the YouTube channel. So it will not be uh, streamed on our uh, website. So please move on to the YouTube channel. And it will be supported by our uh, friends from the Future Food Institute uh, in Bologna that uh, grant us uh, all the technical support. And all our participants from all around the world are waiting for you to celebrate with you this rainbow, this bridge that takes us around the world through food, culture, love, pray. Stay with us. Thank you very much. So see you tomorrow, everyone. Thank you, guys. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ooh.